Welcome to the Nightshade stage. Thanks for sticking with us. The program continues. Um, as you may have heard, there is some rain going on outside. So we had to delay the start of this track a little bit, but here we are. I'm glad you're with us. Um, this is where we're going to have more in-depth discussions, uh, tactical advice for operators, founders, and investors. Uh, and this is why we call it the Nightshade stage. And without further ado, I'm going to kick this off by introducing our first speaker, Magali McIntyre from Egon Zender. She's going to tell us what we learned when crypto imploded. Thank you. Hello, good morning. Thanks for braving the elements to uh, be here today. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Perfect. Great. So my name is Magali McIntyre. I'm French. That's where the accent comes from. That's, I spoiled the game. Um, I'm a leadership advisor. So what I do is I help build and develop teams for technology companies. Um, I've had previous lives. I was in business school when the internet bubble exploded. Um, I was in investment banking at Lehman Brothers in 2008. Then I was a founder and now I'm advising crypto and blockchain businesses on their leadership challenges. So clearly I like to be in the heart of the action. Um, Egan Zander has been advising businesses for six, 60 years. And I myself have been working with crypto and blockchain businesses closely for the past six years. So when Marik a few weeks ago came to see, um, came to see me and asked me, what have you learned this year working closely with those crypto and blockchain businesses? What are the leadership lessons? I thought it was a really good question. And to be honest, um, we tend to move on from one crisis to the next and think, okay, this is a crypto winter. There's a reason why we call it winter, because it's a season. This too shall pass, like the rain. Um, regulators are spooked. That's, that's what's happening when you have an innovation cycle. There's nothing really new to it. Um, but I don't think that's totally true. And I think it's definitely worth pausing and take 10 minutes today to think, what is it that we've learned over the past year and what would we like to do? What should we probably start doing differently? So if there's one thing I've learned working with businesses, and a lot of my work I do is high growth businesses, is that organizations are a function of their leaders. And they reflect both their strengths, their superpowers, and their weaknesses. And those two are very, very tightly linked because when a strength is overplayed, when a superpower is overplayed, it becomes a blind spot. And so I thought, what is specific to the crypto, blockchain, Web3 businesses? What, are, what is unique about their leaders? Well, a lot of it is that their leaders are mostly founders. So to understand those businesses and how to lead those businesses, you need to understand the psychology of founders. And so I went to see some of my clients and asked them, as founders, what do you think your superpowers are in search of their blind spots? And um, there were lots of different answers, but a couple of themes came out very, very clearly. And one was creativity. They see themselves as creative, as the creative brain in the business. And um, it's fantastic. But what we've observed working with them is that they are some flip side of this, being the mastermind of creativity, that everyone needs to be aware of. Um, the first one is that if there's always a new ideas coming up, it's very, very exciting. But it's also really hard to execute and to operate when the ball is constantly moving, when the priorities are changing. And suddenly, the new ideas take over their priority over the previous ideas of yesterday that is just in the middle of the execution. I don't know if it sounds familiar. Um, the second thing that happens when the founder identifies the creative mind is that no one else does. And even if you hire very creative people in your organization, they tend to shrink down because it's not their identity, it's not their job. 
And the cost for organizations are huge, because organizations where not everyone thinks that creativity is their job just doesn't perform as well, purely and simply. The second one is the second, I would say, self-diagnosed superpower that came up was resilience. And this ability to push through everything that happens, take the punches, and they feel they have to be there for everyone and lead from the front, which is fantastic. That's why people follow them. That's why a lot of people join those businesses. Two problems again. One risk is that they might feel like they need to have all the answers. And I, I can relate that as a former founder. And I've been in boardrooms with those founders, and I can see the it can turn into a punching ball. Um, so I, need, I, I get that they, they, they feel like this. Um, but suddenly, there's no empathy. And there's not a dynamic of support in the business, which means that everyone feel isolated and feel that it's not their job to challenge the leader, the almighty leader. Um, and you're going to say, I mean, all this sounds great. We do need leaders who are very creative, and we do need leaders who are very, very resilient. The risk is this learned behavior to tune off any discordant voices. I need to push through. I need to be right. I can't listen to people that are stopping me along the way to tell me I'm wrong. And again, I remember exactly what it feels like. Everyone loves to tell you why your idea is not going to work. If you listen to them all the time, you're never going to get anywhere. But if you don't, you may get caught into your own story and become the only person that's calling the shot. So I think, going through this source process, my conclusion was that creativity and resilience is great, but not without self-awareness. That's the theory. Um, what have we observed working with team in practice? A few things. Over the past two years, a lot of the businesses came to us because they'd scaled, and they needed to bring functional experts into um, some of the key roles. And this is hard because it means letting go. Letting go of your DNA, letting people in who are different, and you feel that the culture is going to suffer, and you're going to lose the magic. And we had a wide range of discussion working with a lot of the players in the industry. And you wouldn't believe how different the briefs can be. There's a whole spectrum of adjectives that leaders use to describe the people they want in their business. And it goes from thought partners, people are going to challenge me, people are going to bridge fresh thinking, to believers. And we had a conversation with a huge business that was part of the implosion, who really believed that they should only appoint believers. And if we have to take some lessons today, we've seen a direct correlation between where those businesses are at and what the level of diversity, cognitive diversity, that they're ready to welcome in their businesses. And so if there was one lesson that we would take away is that you're a believer, bring believer in, but bring people who believe in changing things, people who believe in challenging, in challenging you, and in challenging themselves. The, we spoke to executive in preparation of this chat with you, who have been at the heart of the implosion, and I've seen it, front row, and say, what are your lessons, what are your learning? And it was around the same line, because they were saying, I had this voice in me. I didn't feel like I was a total believer, and so I didn't feel like I belonged, and I didn't speak up. And this is where we are right now, and this is why I left the organization. So, I think it's hard Particularly, this is not easy to come in and challenge. I think it's important to understand that a lot of those people who come to founder-led businesses come from other type of organization. And the way you influence in a founder-led business, high growth and changing the world, is different from their previous life. Because in their previous life, 
they could borrow credibility from experience. Whereas in the businesses that we're in now, you think mostly by first principle. So there is a de-learning and relearning about how you influence, even as a senior exec, before you can even start changing the businesses that you are in. And it's important for the people who come in to understand, and it's important for the people who integrate them to understand that they come from a different world. One we call the complicated world, and one we call the complex world. Different rules, different game. It's, um, it's all the more difficult in a businesses like this one, in our industry, because it's decentralized. And this is something that is new to a lot of people. So they're not playing to their strengths, but they do need to wade in really quickly to make a difference. I think the lesson is it doesn't have to be that way, <laughs> very simply put. Um, this is a new industry with a chance to do things differently, a chance to build new models. And as you're building new technology and new operating model, there is room for a new form of leadership. This is not science fiction. We're working with a lot of teams that are starting by first principle about the type of leadership that they want to bring and understanding how they can bring the best talent from established organization, tech organization, Web2 organization, and bring all this to Web3, because that's the only way you're going to be able to scale and grow is to rely on the lessons of the past. So I'm not going to leave you with some tips, but maybe some questions. What if, what if leaders in Web3 were the one who redefined what good leaderships look like? And you wouldn't believe it, but in Web2, I had discussions with leaders in coaching session about what good leadership looked like, and they all came from American movies from the 80s. So there's plenty of room to do things differently. What if the teams challenge themselves to think about why do we exist? Why do we exist as a group? Why do we even come together as a team? What is our role towards each other, and what is our role to support and wrap our arms against the founder and challenge with care. Some challenges will be specific to your industry because it's decentralized and it's not easy. Um, but some leadership themes are, are universal. And at Egan Zander, we came up with a model a few years ago about what makes a great leader. And in, I think in the end, it's not rocket science. It comes down to four things. The first one we call insights. And insight is the ability to take lots of complex information and make sense of it in the way that people understand. The second one is engagement. And engagement is how do you take people with you when it's difficult? The third one is determination, but not charging through. It's really keeping eye of the target while listening to the dissonant voices along the way. And I, and I think it couldn't be more important, given where we are in the journey in the industry. And the last one, but the most important one, is curiosity. Curiosity is the best indicator, and we've looked at data over 60 years of how successful founders have been, is the first indicator of potential success of a leader, not only in Web3, not only in tech, in any form of leadership. And there's two forms of curiosity. Curiosity towards the world, what's going on, what's happening, what can I learn from, what could my business do differently. But even more importantly, curiosity towards yourself as a leader, the ability to challenge, the ability to reconsider what are the assumptions that I'm making about myself and what the good leaders look like that are getting in my way at this stage of my business. So I wanted to leave you with these thoughts. Um, not here to teach you anything or give you lessons, but if there's one thing that I took away speaking to all those leaders over the last three months, is that through winter, spring, summer, what is going to define the successful
businesses and projects and the others comes down to one thing. Um, stay curious. Thank you very much. Big thanks to Magali there. Um, how to be a leader for all seasons. Stay curious. Um, up next, and by the way, we're running about 50 minutes late on this stage, 50 minutes behind, because we started 50 minutes late. So just FYI, if you look at the schedule, just plus 50 minutes to all those times. Uh, I'm June, I'm your host for today. Uh, I'm with Amplified Event Strategy, and you may have seen some of my work in Coindesk, Quartz, and elsewhere over the years. Up next, uh, we all know USN. We're going to get some updates from NIR's decentralized stablecoin with Denny Ballin and Mark Sugden. Welcome to the stage. You guys can hear me? Yeah? You can hear myself? One, cool. two, three. So we're all familiar with this logo. Thanks for coming, actually, everyone, first and foremost. There's lots of exciting stuff going on out there, so uh, thanks for choosing to spend some time with us. Last time, Denny and I were speaking to a crowd. It was... Uh, Plus 42. Yeah, 42 so, degrees. So it seems like we're a disaster couple. Yeah. So today it's raining and uh, <laughs> pigeons bombing. Yeah, a, a pigeon actually just pooed on me. There's good luck where I'm from. So yeah, I don't know what other cultures, but where I'm from, if a, if a pigeon does that to you, you're in for a treat. So happy days. Um, hopefully this clicker works. Uh, where am I pointing it? No. Is this, is this the right clicker? No? Uh, Talk amongst yourselves. Uh, yeah, any AV people can help me with a clicker. Yeah. I don't. Uh, wrong click. Wrong clicker. User error. Perfect. There we go. There we go. So who are we, Denny? Why don't you tell everyone for the lovely people here that don't know who you are? Uh, well. Considering that I hardly hear you, I'm just reading by your lips. Uh. Hopefully the crowd hears us better. So on the left, that's me <laughs> in the pre-Web3 era when I didn't have the earrings and all that stuff. And I didn't uh, own a little bit of USN. I've been doing uh, projects and products, uh, working with teams, creating value for like 18, 19 years. And finally, I'm here uh, with all of you trying to get my way through crypto world. And what about you, Mark? So I've been in or around technology for my entire professional career, working in IT, managed services, then moved on to FinTech for a payments organization. Um, that role moving into FinTech was always because I wanted to work in the Web3 space. And in that role, I was lucky enough to have some crypto businesses that we facilitated their on and off ramp uh, capabilities. So moving from a payments fintech environment to the near foundation and then you know to a, a financial product was quite a natural evolution for me and uh yeah really really enjoying my time working as, as the previous said you know a new model when i've been you know growing up and working in a really corporate professional environment where if you have a meeting it's all in a room whereas now it's all over the planet so uh yeah enjoying the challenges now what about USN? What, what, what do we look like at the moment? Uh, we're in transition phase. As you know, we have launched in uh, April of 2022 uh, with uh, reserves mostly consisting of NIR and USDT and automatic rebalancing. And the winter that has started this spring, the winter started this spring, showed us that despite the system behaved pretty well and we received uh, pretty nice results, we wanted to do more and to do a much stronger uh, mechanism uh, and the core uh, for, the, for the whole market and the whole industry. So now we're in version two, which in our opinion corresponds much better to the bearish conditions of the market, is uh, much safer and secure as a transactional phase, and currently you can mint your SEN only with stable coins. Um, 
at this time we have been developing the version 3 we'll be releasing this month and I'll be speaking about it a little bit later but most important were we were testing theories doing a lot of simulations to actually make sure that the third version that we release in the coming weeks is something that we are proud of and the market will truly uh, like and uh, value so what have we been doing up to now? It's, uh, we've been lucky to work with a lot of ecosystem partners. This chap here is a nice banker whale, um, custom-made NFT by the team at Nearstarter. All of these are, are partners that we've been working with in the ecosystem. So we've got Tonic, which is one of the new uh, order books launched live on uh, the Near native blockchain. Trisolaris, the, the premier AMM on the Aurora network. We're integrating with them, set up a nice good stable pool there. Bitsa, um, some of you guys probably haven't heard of them. So they are a, a payment application. They're regulated out of Canada, and you can now use USN to pay out in 40 different countries uh, as a settlement and 25 different currencies. So you can use USN, and they will settle locally all through um, the world in all those different currencies. So bringing some real-world user adoption there. We've got Ref Finance. Hopefully, you all know Ref Finance, the first uh, AMM on the near native blockchain. So, working with them to really build up that stablecoin liquidity on the network and make sure that the infrastructure and the tools are there for traders to operate in the ecosystem. And as well as Seat Labs NFT. So, Seat Labs uh, NFT are a ticketing company uh, launched on the near blockchain. And we're working with them where all secondary ticket sales will only be possible via USN. Um, so solving a couple of issues with, you know, that are rife within the ticketing industry. If you want to on-sell those tickets, um, you can get the commission or the artist gets a commission from that resale value, you know, removing the problem of scalping. But that will only be done with USN. So really building up the use case and uh, hopefully the liquidity of it as well. And working with other partners like Banksa, um, who will facilitate people to buy USN with their cards. So I've got my regular bank card. I can go on the Seat Labs app. I can bu buy USN with my card and operate within that infrastructure um, very, very simply. And of course, Huobi there. Huobi are our first centralized exchange partner. Um, really, really helpful team. We're so happy to be working with them. Um, really awesome guys. So what can you do with all this stuff, right? You know, over the summer, farming USN, right? That's why no one here has a tan. Um, you know, we've got good APR for essentially what is one of the you know, safest products on the market. You've got a ref finance pool where you've got USN and USDT. And at the moment, because USN can only be wrapped, uh, can only be minted with USDT, um, it's a very safe farming product. So the, the APY is around 12% for a stable pool. Um, so really good opportunities for farming stables. And in the crypto winter, most of us have a lot of stables sitting there just waiting to capitalize when the market sentiment returns. So providing some functionality there. Um, as well as Trisolaris, we've got a pool going there. Tonic, we've got some incentives going there. And we are working with a whole bunch of partners within the ecosystem to make sure that users of USN are rewarded by their loyalty in testing it out. Um, something that I mentioned already, the version 3, that uh, will appear on testnet in the coming days and will be uh, released on mainnet by end of the month. This is something very special we have been working recently upon. And, uh, you know, as usual, ideas are not new and ideas are cheap, but it all ends with actual implementation and how do you target uh, problems and uh, challenges uh, when solving them. So USN version 3 will include two cores. The first core is stable swap. Let's call it a stable swap uh, that allows you to mint USN with uh, stable coins one-to-one. -one. Obviously, it will include corresponding security mechanisms that will allow to secure and defend the reserves from drying out in case uh, something on the market happens and one of the stable coins depegs and goes down. Now, the second core is uh, CDP-based, the collateral debt position well known to everybody uh, by Maker, uh, by, for example, Burrow. And that will allow to mint, or actually 
borrow, borrow you send for volatile collateral such as BC, BDC, ETH, NIR, and a bunch of other currencies. We believe that USN V3 having two cores actually targets pretty different uh, crowds. Uh, allowing to mint USN extremely cost effectively when using the stable swap core for the retail users and using the CDP core for more uh, DeFi users when they don't want to actually sell their Bitcoin, for example, yet they need uh, funds to operate currently. Uh, both cores will be working in parallel, they will be uh, connected and balancing, corresponding balancing will happen. Uh, so the circulating supply of the USN is always well balanced uh, by the cores that were generating it. I think the pigeon struck again, huh? The, the, the pigeons really don't. Yeah, like yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> cool, so we've all seen the growth of stable coins. I think... Uh, Stablecoins have really set out a niche within, it, within the crypto space and really identified product market fit. We've seen, well, I've seen it because I kind of live and breathe stablecoins, but there, there are pictures of you know, the number of stablecoin addresses continue going up to the right, no matter what the prices of the digital assets are. That's because they're highly functional. Traders can sit in stablecoins and still stay in the market. They want to participate in the ecosystem. We're building up a lot of real-world use cases for payments. And it's not just you and a US and alone. Obviously, there are some real bear moths in the space, like USDT, USDC, DAI. The market is certainly ripe for disruption. So you have to decide... You know, what do people want and why do they want it? And there are certainly trade-offs between decentralization and mass adoption. And those are the kinds of things that we will try and address over time. First and foremost, decentral bank. You know, the clue is in the name. We are all about decentralization. So we think there is certainly a use case there um, that will continue the proliferation of decentralized stablecoins for people to use them outside of, I guess, what we call um, the, the, the mainstream financial system. You know, letting people that are outside those walls, the accredited investors and those kind of things, people that say you are and can do things based on the amount of money we have, we don't believe in that at all. We want to make sure that people are able to send funds to countries that might not necessarily be within the confines of, of the status quo of the current system for various different reasons, making sure we can bank the unbanked, those kind of things. Those are the core, thing, core things, uh, you know, the center of our um, ethos. Now, this graph here is the internet, right? So I'm sure we've all seen that meme of Paul Krugman's, you know, say the internet was a, a fad, you know, it's like a fax machine or something like that. People just are afraid of change sometimes and stable coins are such a huge disruption to the status quo of what goes on today. Working in payments myself, you've all probably had experience in sending money halfway across the world, having to wait three times, going through a whole bunch of rigmarole to, to get the information in and then once you get that information in, there's a corresponding bank somewhere on the chain that needs more information, those kind of things. There's got to be a better way, right? And, and this is what uh, blockchains enable. And we can certainly verify all of the transactions, all the steps along the way, make sure that you know, we've got full visibility of what is currently a very opaque system. You, know, you don't know what corresponding bank your payment is with at the moment, how much they've got, why it's held up. You know all the steps of a chain in a blockchain. So that's why we are going to see, as more people get into the crypto space, get Web3 wallets, we're still not there yet, you know. I, I bought a beer with my NIR or USN the other day. And, you know, it, it's still, it's fun, you know. We're into Web3, we enjoy it, but the user experience is still not there from a wallet, um, a wallet point of view. But there are so many people here today, a lot of you even, that are all working on that UX, right? So if we keep on building the infrastructure in place, that's where we're going to start seeing that hockey stick up to the right from an adoption point of view because we see the use cases there. It's all about the UI, the usability. Um, so that's why we're doing this. There's plenty of plenty of room for stable coins to grow and we want to be there right, right in the middle of that. Um, we want to point out the key unique features of USM. I think the most unique feature is the sustainable yield generation that by design is the feature of USN and hardly any other stable can offer that. How does it actually work? 
the near that will be placed into the reserve will be staked. And the staked awards will be then converted to USN and distributed. And this is the feature that uh, greatly uh, differentiates us from many other stable coins on the market. The other feature is that in nearest future, I think it's uh, third quarter of this year, the transactions in USN will be actually paid in USN. So now you don't need to have near on your wallet to transact in USN. And we believe that's a major step forward because currently, if you want to send USDT, you need to have ETH or TRX or whatever. Uh, by end of the year, we plan to go full cross-chain, literally, make the experience of bringing collateral on uh, Ethereum and receiving USN on NEAR make it seamless, make it literally one click, allowing you to deposit funds on one layer one and receive uh, USN on the other protocol. And the number four is, of course, we're looking forward uh, to moving to full decentralization, which uh, obviously includes the structure of the product from the legal point of view, of course, the governance and the technical side of things. So, if any of you have any questions, we've got a, a booth down in the ecosystem uh, section, so come find us, we'll have a chat. Um, call to action, you know, if you can think of a way that USN would help your users, anything you're building, um, interested in taking part in the ecosystem, we welcome all conversations. And of course, the DAO will be open to anyone to come and contribute. So pop by the Discord, um, come and let us know if you have any ideas or want to contribute in any way. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Stablecoin uh, pioneers here. Um, up next, though, uh, Danny is not going anywhere. He's going to stay on stage. He's going to come back. We're going to have a panel discussion about the future of stablecoins, uh, moderated by Lindsay Crawford of Proximity Labs. So come on up. Welcome to the stage. Edward from Hobby as well. I will leave you in Lindsay's capable hands. Um, so first up, we have Denny, who is just, just up here speaking. Um, he is the leading, one of the leading product managers um, of Decentral Bank um, and comes from a background of working in IT for over 19 years. Um, and he's very much a magician with various types of products that he's built um, previous to crypto. Um, and we have Edward Chen as well that is joining us from Huobi as the global head of listings um, and head of asset strategy. Um, previous to Huobi, he was an executive director and CEO um, on the Singapore Huobi arm um, and spearheaded Huobi's global APAC um, strategy operationally. Um, and today, I think the first question I want to launch into is kind of understanding where you found crypto and, and what makes you specifically passionate about stablecoins for, for you, George? Um, yeah, for my experience with crypto, it's uh, quite a, how do you say that, quite interesting, it's, it's okay, right? Quite interesting uh, story because uh, go back to the early 2018, uh, I have no knowledge about crypto. I don't even know uh, what is Bitcoin and uh, you know, I don't even know what is Hobby and our founder, Leon, we have no idea. So my investor, introduced me to them and say how say Huobi in China they are the biggest one biggest crypto exchange they want to go to the global market they were looking for some good talent to join them and uh, guide them so that's why they invite me to help them so in the very beginning I just have you know casual talk but after my own company is being merged uh, they say hey hey man it's the right time and you know it's, uh, it's uh, the new er area for the for the you know for the uh, for the crypto that's why I joined them. So that's the start of the whole story of my, my crypto uh, experience. And then, uh, yeah, as you just mentioned, I, I, in the past, I, I, I used to lead a lot of different business within the group. So in the very beginning for the global expansion, so we help on the Vietnam market expansion. So we're still one of the biggest uh, and uh, the, the best uh, influencer crypto uh, venue in Vietnam. And then I, I moved to lead the institution business I have some e colleagues, uh, e -colleague friends, all, uh, you know, sit down 
and uh, we do a very, uh, a very quick expansion uh, uh, to gain the market share from 2% to 70% in one and a half year mm. for the whole company. And then the company adjust me to, to hit the, the listing department and uh, you know, the asset hub now. But, and uh, we do a very, uh, very fast uh, uh, adjustment, go, go back to the end of quarter four last year. Uh, and uh, in the first uh, half year of 2022, we have around over 230 projects to list with us and do the, all kinds of collaborations with us. And uh, we used to have a lot of experience with other uh, new uh, you know, innovative stable coins. And uh, we always trade USA is one of the best of, with them. So that's why we continue to talk with Danny and uh, you know, Nia Foundation. Till the day we have a chance to successfully uh, launch them. Yeah. Excellent. Um, and Denny, for you, um, what kind of launched you into crypto given your diverse background? What, what brought you to Web3? Um, I think luck and chance. <laughs> um, kidding. As you know, um, one of the booths there is near UA, which is a pretty powerful Ukrainian hub within the near ecosystem. And obviously, um, uh, I had some friends there um, trying to grow it. And the other day, last year, December 2021, I just uh, gave a call and said, hey, uh, uh, I want to enter crypto. And, and they said just two words stable coin <laughs> and literally in a few weeks uh, after doing a lot of uh, reading and research that was absolutely uh, amazingly new uh, field to me zero knowledge um, and uh, I did hear uh, Bitcoin before that I did but um, by end of those a few weeks uh, I was able to come up with a pretty um, valuable I'd call it a research uh, that uh, made guys uh, uh, believe in me and uh, my opportunity to bring value to the central bank as an advisor. So that path for me started literally like eight months ago and I'm extremely motivated and uh, well, this whole Web3 thing is extremely fascinating and I'm sure that uh, uh, on one hand as much as we are making the huge experiment we are part of the experiment nevertheless but we have that amazing opportunity to build the new world you know uh, make tomorrow come and happen today um, when internet started I was uh, too young so uh, now it's uh, our time I think I'd have to agree with that um, so Edward question for you as far as people um, curious about what's the what is the actual use case for stable coins um, and you know for it as well as against um, if you could dive into that a bit for us uh, you mean a usage case for stable coin yes uh, centralized decentralized all kind all type of stable coins yes yeah I mean so for stable coin usage in the very beginning uh, we need to look at back to the history uh, when you know go to the the last round of the bull market go back to 2017 um, during that stage, a lot of people, they want to enter the market, they want to, in a very beginning, they're only for the financial uh, utility, like trading, like lending, borrowing, right? So they need some uh, very good, uh, how do you say that, uh, kind, of, uh, 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 kind of stuff which can help them to transfer their fiat asset into the crypto. So that's why, the, that's the beginning of the stablecoin, in the very beginning. And during that stage, it's only centralized the type of the, um, uh, stablecoin like Tether USD, like Circle USD. So they are controlled by the centralized uh, institutions. They are handled by centralized uh, collector stations, everything. But after that, when we go to the DeFi summer, uh, a new, a new, uh, a new space came out. Uh, the community is uh, is, uh, is passionate about it, and we see uh, a very good uh, uh, utility utilization and advantage of to to use the the real uh, blockchain technology. To make it more, you know, how do you say that, uh, transparent and uh, more high efficient for the usage of the the, the capital. So that's uh, so that's why the decentralized stablecoin came out. And so far, uh, from from a crypto exchange angle, we see uh, uh, two main scenarios for the stablecoin. Number one is definitely trading because there's still a lot of institutions, API traders, crypto investors on the market. They want to look for a very good arbitrage space. The stablecoin is one of the good uh, you know, use case for them. 
Another one is, uh, as just Danny and Mark mentioned, so, uh, at the end of the day, it's a currency, right? Even stablecoin is a currency. Why you need a currency? Because you need a, a, a stuff which you can exchange the value between each other. So, so the stablecoin, another a big uh, a scenario is definitely utilization. But it really depends on which part of the utilization you want to use. In the very beginning, it's definitely start from a payment. So that's the two main parts we see so far. But in the, maybe in the coming future, as uh, Danny just mentioned, we have a lot of new uh, you know, space came out, a lot of new uh, uh, scenarios came out. Maybe people will use uh, a stable coin for other stuff as well. Yeah. So it's obviously been a challenging year for stable coins in general. Um, what do you think, and, and, and clearly knowing that there's, a, there's an importance for stable coins um, in, in Web3, um, what are you thinking are the ways to transition Web2 to Web3 adoption within stable coin? Uh, you mean use the stablecoin to uh, adopt uh, more users from Web2 to Web3? Correct. Yeah, I mean, yeah, uh, um, so for Web3 users, I mean, for Web2 users, the main challenge for them is, number one, the understanding of the concept. How are you going to understand what is Web3? How you understand what is you know, decentralization and uh, what's the advantage of it and why you want to use it or why you have to use it? Because a lot of users, when they stay in the Web2, they, they get used to Web2. They think Web2 is best. They think Web2, you centralize, everything's good. You can use it right here. You use you know, food delivery. You can use all this stuff. You think everything's good. But uh, very few people, they start to realize that, oh, there's still a lot of way to optimize. Uh, so the number one is definitely how to let them know and uh, uh, recognize the concept. And number two, when they really have the awareness, how they're going to move themselves into the utilization of the, you know, the Web3 world. So stablecoin is very important because not every single uh, applications we see on the market now, they have the good uh, fiat solution, which means if you have the US dollar, you have the Euro dollar, you have the Singapore dollar, as I did, I stayed in Singapore, I want to use the Singapore dollar to get, it, uh, to, to get it used to, to enjoying the decentralized application, it's really hard. So how are you going to use it? You need a stablecoin to, to solve it. So mm -hmm. that's the reason why, yeah. yeah. And Denny, um, as far as your perspective on what's the use case um, for stablecoins and in general um, within Web3, the importance of it, what are your thoughts? Um, I, would, uh, I would agree with the Edward and, uh, you know, really not much to add. I personally see two main use cases. The number one is that um, stablecoin is a great tool for exchanging of value, literally paying for something. And the second one is, of course, everything related to trading and uh, financial activity when one wants to park their, uh, I don't know, Bitcoin into something more stable for a period of time or exit into a stable coin because of some reasons. So uh, obviously, um, payments are hardly possible without stable coins because in the morning, Bitcoin has one price. In the evening, it has the other price. And uh, equally, the DeFi world and the trading world needs uh, some method of, uh, I would say, not transacting value, but uh, storing value, actually, which uh, also the stable coin plays this role uh, greatly. And then specifically to USN, um, it's obviously becoming a fairly crowded space with stable coins. Um, what differentiates USN um, to the others? Um, great question, thank you. First of all, uh, the number one differentiator, I believe, is that uh, USN is able to provide, I'd call it native and sustainable yields when near from the reserve is actually staked into a near validator and the res uh, received awards are then converted into USN. This is the feature literally that is utilizing the nature of uh, near protocol, which is a DPoS protocol. And uh, hardly any other stable coin can offer that, uh, especially centralized cannot. Uh, those that are launched on uh, Mm, blockchains that don't actually support this kind of uh, functionality cannot offer these type of yields. Uh, that's number one. Number two is uh, the huge difference will uh, be related to transactions in USN to be paid in USN, which means you don't need uh, additionally near or 
Ethereum or TRX, depending on the uh, protocol you're making the transaction on, in order to transact in USN. And I think that's an amazing, great uh, step forward to, towards something that Web3 uh, industry really needs today, and that is being user-friendly. Because right now, uh, we as participants of the industry, we have a pretty good idea how things work, and they do work, and a lot of things uh, is possible today already. But at the end of the day, it is uh, pretty complicated, and it reminds me much more about how you would interact with actual internet back in the days. Uh, and uh, we need to make those steps to make it user-friendly. So obviously, you want to transact in USN, you don't need to have anything else. You can transact in USN, and the commission will automatically be deducted, uh, converted, and uh, the gas fees will be paid. And the third uh, feature that doesn't make uh, USN um, unique per se, but I think we're uh, placing extra stress on that, that is USN version 3 that to be launched uh, by end of this month will have two cores, as I mentioned. The stable swap core, extremely um, uh, extremely financially efficient one-to-one -one minting from other stable coins. That is more for retail users. The, that is more for those who maybe want to be rebalance their risk when compared to owning just USDT or just USDC. But on the other hand, we'll have the uh, second core, the CDP-based core, working parallel, which is which has a much more DeFi-ish uh, kind of. Um, speciality, I don't know, uh, that will allow people to uh, keep their Bitcoin yet get some amount of uh, USN and use it on the market and then be able to safely return it and get their Bitcoin back. Uh, the other very important thing about launching the CDP core is that in addition to launching the actually uh, the second core that's able to uh, mint USN from over collateralized positions. The important thing is that we're adding the functionality of a money market where, for example, you can bring your BTC, receive USN, and I can uh, loan your BTC, which makes your collateral actually work and earn additional yield for you. And that mix of, on one hand, giving you a very clear feature of, hey, you want USN, here you go. On the other hand, we're giving you the opportunity that your collateral, or at least part of it, will always stay at work and bring additional yield. And we believe that this mix of one hand uh, kind of straightforward stablecoin functionality, mint redeem, mint redeem, uh, with the functionality of allowing the collateral to earn and under, mm, let's say, uh, bullish market conditions, it will be greatly utilized. Uh, we believe that uh, that's a great mix. Th these three points. And Edward, um, I know we discussed a little bit earlier uh, your take on what makes a stablecoin competitive in an already very competitive ecosystem. Would you mind diving into that a little bit? Okay, the competitiveness of the stablecoin. Yes. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. To be friendly, we see a lot of uh, stablecoin operator on the market, or a lot of team. They have the passion to run a good stablecoin project, but it's uh, to be friendly. Uh, the, the successful case is very f rather few uh, than, than the failure case because, uh, um, you know, number one, you, you really need to have a very good command of, uh, you know, economics, you know, the currency, you know, how to run a, a very good economic system well. That's number one. Number two, uh, uh, not only for the, you know, the understanding and the, and the setup, the whole mechanism, but you also need how to operate well. That's the main part. As just Danny mentioned, right? So you need to have a very good uh, uh, usage case. You have to have very good utilization case. I think that angle is very good. I mean, you tell, uh, you, you divide your uh, how do you say your your solutions or usage case based on different uh, your target audience, so demand, the real demanding. That's that's the most important part. Uh, but the majority of the uh, stablecoin operators or team uh, on the market, they don't do that. They just focus on their own concept build up. They think, oh, this is a good idea. I, I think the algorithm I set up is, is fantastic, but they didn't do, they didn't, you know, look from the, the user angle. I think that's that's a very important part. You have to look for, through the user angle, uh, why they need your stable coin, what kind of uh, what kind of scenario they need your stable coin. By this, uh, you build a very strong demanding pool and uh, and uh, convert this demanding pool into your liquidity, and uh, uh, and convert your liquidity into your you know bigger size of the you know. 
that uh, the volume pool, and then you have a very strong market share on the market. So that that would be uh, a very important competitiveness strategy. Yeah. So we were always trying to support this type of the strategy because uh, from a centralized uh, institution, we used to have our own stablecoin, which you just mentioned, right? But now we don't have. So we, we're willing to. To, to back all the stable stablecoin uh, operators who have very good uh, you know operation and strategies. So I think USA is one of the best for them. So we, we're very happy to support them and open our community to them. But uh, we need to real build up everything based on our community's demanding. That will be the key. Yeah. So you said good operations and strategy. What does that look like to you? Uh, you mean the stablecoin strategy yes. for us? No, uh, we don't. We don't have. We don't have straight stablecoin strategy so far. Yeah, we just support other third parties uh, stablecoin. Yeah. And as far as with USN, Denny, um, what what is kind of strategy and operations to you for for getting seeking excellence for USN? What does that look like? Um, I think. Uh, I think everything, and the, including the strategy, is something that's constantly in the works and constantly evolving. Uh, there is no way we'll uh, reach perfection because Web3 world and the whole industry is uh, changing, uh, and, uh, uh, yeah, changing uh, faster than uh, anything else. Um, I think the key points of our current strategy is that um, First of all, we're doing everything possible to make you sound uh, stable and reliable. Because without building trust and b b without uh, clearly stating why you send is stable, why uh, the audience, the user should uh, not even, you know, somebody might use the word believe, but I don't like that word because uh, usually uh, people are asked to believe in something that uh, kind of uh, has doubt to it. But in our case, we want to make it very clear that this is USN. That's how it's built. There is no doubt uh, that it is stable because it's stable by its design. That is why we um, transitioned from version one, though it was uh, pretty stable, very strong. Nevertheless, not as good as we want it to be uh, for today, for the future of the industry. So building trust uh, as a result of clearly uh, displaying and explaining why USN is stable is number one. Number two, exactly uh, as Edward said, we're really targeted on understanding what are the main uh, use cases and clearly looking at some other stable coins which are pretty big on the market today uh, looking back at the days when they launched how they evolved how they grew uh, well it was pretty clear why they did this and they didn't do that but USN was launched in spring of 2022 right um, there are a lot of competitors on the market. There are a lot of things that somebody did, somebody will do. And we have to pave our own way. And that forces us not just to do what we think is right, but rather to understand what the market needs. That's why there are two cores targeting the more retail kind of users and more DeFi kind of users. Yeah, yeah I have something to add on here. So because for the stable coin, uh, how do you say, battle or competitiveness, it's very similar as you know the centralized crypto exchange battle and the competitiveness as we're facing now. But uh, this one ultimate, uh, uh, how do you say, a strategy is always the right strategy. Trying to find uh, the incremental part of the user case because when you're doing the existing market battle, you will always higher cost to convert the existing users. But as Danny mentioned, if a USN find a very good, you know. Uh, uh, incremental scenario, which all these users are new for the stablecoin, then it's quite easy for USN to gain a market share and uh, to become more influenceable on the market. Yeah. And then at Huobi, how do you garner trust with users for onboarding for stablecoins or otherwise? Sorry, I can repeat again. How do you garner trust with users for uh -huh. onboarding and, and creating that sense of transparency for transparent uh, for for the u for the stablecoin for the for the users for yes. the users uh, for us how how you define the transparency? Yes. Uh, how, our transparency? You mean for stablecoin or for the our crypto? Agent? Either or. <laughs> Either word. Uh, 
Um, I mean, for stablecoin transparency, they're very straightforward, right? You can search everything online, on, on chain, right? Everything is uh, transparent. But for centralized crypto exchange as us, we're trying to show everything as much as we can. But uh, there's still some centralized part which we cannot show to the users, like you know, risk control system and security control system, right? All these parts you cannot show. But for the you know, stablecoin, you can always do that. Yeah. But uh, how how centralized institution to to prove to the users that you are transparent enough or you are trustworthy enough is by you know the regulation or the license. Because you have a third party to endorse you, they say, hey, Hobie is good, right? As, so that's why we are continuously getting a lot of license globally. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I think we are running up on time here. But if there's any last comments or, or statements you want to make specifically about stable coins, please do. Yeah. You go. Me. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, for myself, I mean, we, we're willing to look uh, to, to find a more, you know, new, innovative, and a better stablecoin solution on the market. And we're always trying to back them, to support them. Uh, even we created the China market, we're still uh, very active on the global market. Uh, we try all kinds, of, and we have very strong uh, uh, presence in Asia. We're still one of the top five in, uh, top, top three in Asia, top five in globally. So we're still trying best. To, to back all the strong uh, stablecoin operators. So that's our attitude. But in terms of the, in terms of the technology side, uh, to be frankly, we are not expert expertise. We cannot tell much. But there's one thing we think is very important. Is, uh, at the end, it's the collateral. You have to have enough collateral to support your uh, project. Otherwise, a little bit challenged. Another part is you have to think carefully about your growth strategy. Only by this, we know how we're going to uh, leverage our resource to support the project we, uh, we, we like, yeah, as, like, for example, USN. Yeah. As for me, I believe, I truly believe that uh, the future of Web3 is uh, tightly connected with the whole industry of stable coins building, uh, building out. And uh, for now, despite stable coins have been on the market for a few years by now, I think that is uh, very much still the very first stages of this uh, gigantic, I'm, I'm absolutely sure, gigantic industry. And uh, I think uh, these are great times. Somebody might say that, hey, uh, if you launched uh, USN like a few months before the events of May, um, well, yeah, from one point of view, that could have kind of been better. But uh, I'm afraid that it could have been better only in an extremely um, short time period, in a short run. But in a long run, I'm a great believer that, you know, kind of uh, bad times create strong people, strong projects. And exactly the events of May, the reasons why we switched to version 2 and now switching to version 3, is actually that complicated path we're going uh, that allows us to finally, you know, create that multifaceted, complicated solution that is actually has higher chances to stay on the market for many years, yet be um, ahead technically and governance-wise and maybe even legally compared to some other popular stable coins that have been on the market for ages. So. I also believe that as we're building out USN, um, I think we're serving an extremely important kind of mission for the whole industry. And that is we are showing that uh, the whole industry needs to uh, become a little bit more honest with themselves and st stop. Well, obviously, it's impossible, 100%. But majority of people need to start kind of um, mm, believing projects that provide realistic yields, where transparency is key, where these, uh, these literally features of the project and the team and the people behind it are the proof that the project is here to stay for many years. Again, not pointing fingers at anyone. We've seen beautiful examples of how people tried, but the market said, like, hey, doesn't matter what you try, the rules are this. And if we don't want people to keep on losing money, and at the same time, the Web 2 world looking at Web 3 pointing fingers at us and saying that they're scammers, obviously we're not. 
This is extremely important to make this balance of transparency, honesty, realistic expectations. And I think this important mission is upon all of ourselves. Yeah. I would have to agree with that. <laughs> well, thank you both, um, Jenny and George. Um, it was a pleasure. And I think up next. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Hey, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thanks, Lindsay. Thank you to, the, to all our panelists, Lindsay, Denny, and Edward. Uh, now, you guys are going to want to stick around for the next two sessions because they're going to be big. It's a sharding double header, and we're going to kick it off with sharding phase one, why you should be excited. A talk by Max from Pagoda. Come on up, Max. All right, well, everyone, hello, I'm Max. Uh, today we're going to talk about a very exciting thing that is happening right this moment on uh, near mainnet, which is the transition to the sharding phase one. And you want to stick around because this more certainly relates, like it's very relevant to you too, whether you are a validator, developer, user, token holder, it is all very relevant. So I'm Max. Uh, I don't know how many of you know me. I'm actually here on behalf of Bowen, who couldn't come today. I'm a VP of engineering in Pagoda, um, and actually the first employee at NIR in general. Uh, before that, I was at Google, and also did PhD in computer science. So what is, what is phase one? Um, up until now, if you are a validator on NIR mainnet, you have to run a node which validates all of the shards and does the block production. And uh, this is quite a lot of the CPU computation, and you need a lot of state, and you need all that to be collocated on the same machine. So this is not the way to do sharding. So what we're doing now, we're transitioning to the phase where you can start up a node that will be only doing the validation of a single shard. And it will do four times less CPU computation and will require four times less state. And this is pretty big and important because there are major implications to this transition. Well, first of all is that we can have simply more validators. So today we have 100 validators on mainnet. Now you're going to have 300. And one thing that I wanted to understand is that near validators are actual real validators. Like every blockchain has their own definition of the validators. But on near, if you're a validator, you're not just earning staking rewards. You are actually securing every single header every second that mainnet produces. So if we have 300 validators, there are 300 signatures every second securing every single header, whether it's a block header or chunk header. And it's a pretty big deal, because going from 100 to 300 validators increases the security and decentralization of the entire mainnet threefold. Then uh, obviously, phase one is the only one milestone of our big sharding roadmap. It's an important stepping stone phase two that I'm going to explain later. And finally, one thing that not many actually talk about is it's this unique power of the near blockchain, which is we can actually reduce the hardware requirements uh, for some of the nodes that do not do the validation of all of the shards. So if you do four times less CPU computation and you need four times less disk space, you can run four times cheaper instance. We haven't done it this yet, but it's coming up pretty shortly. So near blockchain is really the only blockchain out there that not only increases its capacity, not only scales, but it drastically reduces hardware requirements. And I don't mean like minor optimizations by like 10% or so, which is something that many blockchains do, but 4x hardware requirements drop. And this is all coming. So this phase one was a truly community effort. And I'm incredibly proud of that. The code was written by Pagoda this time. But I hope that in the future, the code for the protocol will be written by the community too. This time, the community helped us test this code and iterate on it. And we had 1,500 people joining in and working with us for many months on actually testing this phase one. 
And the other even cooler thing is that the whole thing was organized by the community too. And the prominent uh, parties from the, that organized the stake wars will be here today after my talk during the panel. So stick around and hear from them. So what is this phase two that will be coming probably next year? So phase two will drop the requirement to have nodes that validate all of the shards. Uh, because even with phase one, you still need block producers to validate all of the shards. But with phase two, this will be completely eliminated. And this also is a pretty major milestone. Because today, we cannot just simply increase number of shards from, eight, uh, from four to eight. Because for some of the nodes, that will mean that they would need to run twice more expensive hardware. But once we transition to phase two, this will no longer happen. And we can just increase the number of shards with any repercussions to the hardware costs. It's pretty neat. So I also want to talk about the usage of the, of the near blockchain. This is also another thing that not many people are talking about. We've been very focused on the transactions and TPS in the blockchain space, but this is not the only way you measure the usage of the blockchain. Also because every blockchain defines transactions differently. On near blockchain, a transaction is actually a user interaction. And sometimes even multiple user interactions batch in a single transaction. So on near blockchain, transaction is not a network message. It's not an RPC request. It's an actual user interaction. And uh, there are pretty cool metrics outside the transactions too. So the most impressive one to me is how many messages minute nodes exchange every second just to establish consensus. And it is 50, uh, 500,000 messages every second exchanged just by validator nodes on the mainnet. And I want to assure you that our network is really optimized, and we try to exchange as, as little as possible messages between the nodes. The other important numbers are how many read requests we're getting for people who run the apps on, on the mainnet. So Pagoda maintains this public RPC endpoint that everyone is using, and we have 11,000 RPC reads every second from the apps. And this is also because the apps are so easy to build on near and have the interface very responsive that people really leverage the RPC uh, when they build the apps on Nier. We, th this whole thing w it was only possible because we invested significant amount of effort in reliability and performance of Nier mainnet. And if you've been around, you know that since we launched mainnet two years ago, we had zero downtime. And it was only because we invested an incredible amount of the resources in that. We also have low latency for the RPC. But even most importantly, we have the protocol upgrades happening all the time. We had almost 30 protocol upgrades happen since the beginning. And this is the actual power of near blockchain, because we can introduce almost any protocol feature in this way. We, we truly have not encountered any feature on other bl uh, blockchains that we haven't thought could be introduced in near protocol. So if you're very excited about some protocol features on other blockchains. Maybe you've seen some virtual machine that you like, or contract language. Or maybe you want to have some kind of integration. For instance, recently people have been discussing integration with Cosmos. Please come to us and uh, propose, either through any uh, uh, enhancement proposal or the what's so called work groups, introducing these features for the near protocol. Really want this to be community effort. It shouldn't be just Pagoda building all of the code like we do today, it should be done by the entire community. So if you have ideas and you know what you want to implement, submit proposal, come to the work groups. If you're just excited and you want to help in some way, come to our community groups and brainstorm with everyone. And uh, even create your own community group if you want. There is going to be a talk uh, tomorrow by Ori, which is called High Standards. This is where he's going to tell you how we're going to be decentralizing development of near protocol in general. But you can also visit this URL and also stop by our booth to learn how you can help us. So that is it from me. Please subscribe to our tweet and check out this QR code. Thanks so much for that, Max. You can go off stage. We are going to reset the stage for a large community panel uh, to talk over all of those things that Max just mentioned, Stake Wars and more with uh, all of Pagoda's community partners. So if you've just joined us, I'm June. I'm your host for the stage today. 
This stage is running 50 minutes behind, so plus 50 minutes on the agenda. If you look at the agenda, we're 50 minutes behind um, because we had to start a little late. Now, I th believe we are almost set. Uh, I'm going to invite Chetna Desai from Pagoda on stage, and she's going to bring up the rest of her panel. Big hand for Chetna. Hello, now. <laughs> hey, everyone. Thanks for being here. Um, I know. Uh, not really weather-wise complying, but uh, we are so grateful that you're all here. Uh, with the panel, I'm really excited to bring um, our community partners, as well as some of the Pagoda speakers on stage. First up, um, we have Henry from Open Charts. <laughs> and we have uh, AVB Alejandro from Metapool. We have Stanley from MetaWeb. And our very own George from Pagoda. Woo! Not but not least, uh, Max from Pagoda. All right. Oh, can you guys hear me with my mic now? Awesome. Go. All right. Excellent. Um, so we are all thrilled to be here. Um, I think um, I want to just call out a, a quick cue, which is uh, we at NIR believe in building, creating without any limits. Uh, what I mean by that is no limits in terms of building anything on NIR. Uh, for example, you can use any language, not just Rust. Um, we have JS SDK as well to support hundreds of millions of developers who can actually onboard easily. The second is what the theme is, sharding, right? The dynamic sharding, which is our future, um, where there's no limits for hyperscaling, right? So you can scale up and down, as Max mentioned. Uh, with that cue, um, I want to go into panel and kind of focus on the partners here, um, asking them, in, in your perspective, because you're close partners with us, give us a little bit about why near for you in terms of sharding specifically. Yeah. Go ahead, Henry. Okay, yeah, I'll go right ahead. So, you know, when I looked at uh, different blockchains, I looked at uh, NIR and its sharding capabilities and what they had forecasted looked like it was really uh, not only good from a technology stack, but also from a developer. So what's great about NIR is you don't have to focus on the technology. You build your dApp, you build your code base, and the tech just works. So I think that's the best uh, benefit there. Yeah. AVB. Yeah, I tend to come at it from like the product user experience side of things. And when you look at different blockchains and their approach to scalability, it may scale with like strings attached. So when you look at Near and the fact that you can have cross contract calls, the developers, yeah. the programs, the users don't have to know or care which shard they leave on. The network can expand and contract based on demand. There are very simple messages that really resonate with people that want to build real products that are going to be here in five, ten years, and that they must have the assurance that the network can keep up with their growth. So, yeah, Stanley, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, agree with uh, AVP. So uh, we've been you know, looking at different blockchains, and obviously, I think Near has struck the perfect balance between scalability and performance and security and decentralization. So, like for a liquid staking protocol, you know, you want to actually help decentralizing the blockchain and saying, you know, sharding, you know, chunk owning production and in the future dynamic sharding, like that's like built in decentralization, you know, on the protocol level. And that's, that works very well with the liquid staking protocol. So yeah, that's why we, you know, we chose near and that's why we decided to, you know, participate in stake war and help promoting, you know, sharding uh, to a bigger community. Yeah, thank you all. Max, going to you about, uh, specifically about the sharding piece um, that you mentioned, um, like, what is it unique to near from other layer one blockchain that we have in terms of sharding, right? So everybody mm -hmm. claims that it's sharding, but what in particular the near um, that they should look for, especially the builders, developers, and entrepreneurs? 
with many other blockchains that have some form of sharding, whether they call it sharding or not, you do really have trade-offs, usually with developer experience. Usually developer experience is an afterthought, mostly because all of the, all of the hype in two years ago was about consensus algorithms or some kick-ass gimmicks. But Nier was focused on developer experience from the very early days, so we'd figure out how to do sharding without degrading developer experience. And our ideal is to, for you as a developer to not even think that we have sharding. We want you to just deploy a smart contract and don't bother like, with what is hap happening behind the scenes, which is entirely the opposite to many other blockchains that you know, want you to learn and appreciate the complexity of whatever tech that they have built, and learn you know, about the consensus algorithm and, you know, and, and, and build around that. And this is entirely the opposite to, to near approach. Thank you. George, do you have anything to add on top of that? Sure. Uh, so looking at it from a different angle, that simplicity which we want to give uh, to the application developers and that scalability actually behind the scenes translates into a lot of effort that, that we're uh, doing ourselves to make the protocol easy to adopt. And that effort is a community effort. It comes from Pagoda and from all the partners who are um, actually with us in, in the effort of creating a stable and uh, a scalable blockchain. So all those 28 releases that, that Max mentioned and all the journey towards sharding is a group journey that, that we're happy to, to share with our partners um, and that we want to take step by step while keeping the, the, the mainnet stable and also allowing it to adapt to whatever applications you, you want to put on top of it. Yeah, totally makes sense. Uh, so taking that further down is, so we know the, what, what's a unique value prop uh, from the near sharding perspective. Like, let's delve into looking back a little bit, right? Since the mainnet release um, and the phase one, we are getting towards the sharding phase one release, which is supposed to be September 21st. Um, what has it been the journey uh, from the partner's perspective? Let's start from the partner's perspective. Like, uh -huh. how has that been? for you to build alongside Pagoda, right? And, and coming from the com community point of view, and I think Max mentioned a lot of numbers, statistics and such, but I want to get your kind of point of view here sure. as well. Yeah, I'll go. Um, yeah, so I think that one of the key things is that as we've deployed sharding over time, there's not really been a significant change to either the D apps or the uh, validators themselves other than the protocol upgrade, I mean, you didn't really see any change. So as we get more uh, decentralized, as we scale more, as we uh, put on new protocol features, it's been very seamless. So I think from a validator perspective, it's been very uh, pretty easy for the most part. Um, and we've not really had any major hiccups in the chain at all with, with all of the progress we've made, so. <clears throat> That's always good to hear. That's right. Nice. Yeah, from my perspective, I really like the finding the right balance between having a strong core technical team delivering these improvements and the community involvement. So we've been around since the very beginning, Open Shards Alliance, uh, Metapool, enabling, empowering, training the new sets of validators, you know, since Stake Wars 2 and the last batch of 40 validators to Stake Wars 3 and the next batch of 100, 200 validators. Mm -hmm. It's been really interesting to see how you know the baby gets thrown out of the <laughs> whatever the saying is thrown out of the ship and it starts swimming and it's been an interesting journey but it's good to see that it's possible like the developer experience is there and uh, yeah community that's that's always a pleasure to hear um, Stanley do you want to add yeah I mean we've been you know working with different communities uh, from day one and the validators and, and also retail users. Um, and also, ob obviously, a near protocol and a tech team. And it's amazing that, you know, uh, we've, you know we, we've done phase zero last year, and then now it's phase one. And like, we've been really doing, um, you know, fundamental changes, you know, on the protocol level, but it's so super smooth. Nobody's affected, either validators or users. I mean, that's amazing for us. Um, and also, um, yeah, it's great to see that we are actually, you know, helping uh, you know, onboarding more validators and also onboarding more stakers. And it's great to see, you know, both sides are like growing. And like right now, you know, it's a sick war. So we've, you know, onboarded, you know, a couple hundred new Hong Kong validators. And also on the other side, um, users are, you know, staking their, their near more to the protocol. And I think that's a super, 
you know, that's a very, very promising and very healthy growth uh, for us to see. Uh, yeah, and, I mean, we definitely see that you know, going into the future. So. That's, that's excellent. And uh, George, um, do you want to kind of bring a um, full, full round perspective? Like, that is from the community and the validator perspective. But if, if in the audience we have a lot of builders and developers, how that is significant um, in terms of sharding and for them to build on near blockchain? So what it basically boils down to is to making sure that the network has the capacity required for the applications that run on top of it. Mm -hmm. And this, this then uh, gets translated into multiple things, like lower costs or, or being able to have mo um, a larger number of transactions on the network. But at the end of the day, as a developer, your main focus should be on your application, on your business logic, on, on your product. And you should take the, the blockchain as a foundational piece of technology that works and is there for you whenever you need it. And that it also is with you as part of, of your journey when you're going to have success and you're going to have users and your application is going to grow. The building blocks that you're using have to grow together with you. And um, the scalability that Nier offers and all the sharding that the work that uh, we're doing and we, we're planning to do will help a lot in that, in that dimension. Yeah. And I think we had a lot of learning throughout the State Course episode three, right? So we talk about, uh, we have the calls that we talk about, bring all the feedback from the community uh, through the partners, and we also do that through Discord. Um, it's, it's humbling, to say the least, like the feedbacks that we get, um, both good in terms of the wins and also in terms of the learnings, right? So the things that we can actually take that as a learning for the, the the future of the shardings, right? So that brings to the, the next topic that I wanted to talk about is the future, right? So I think Max sort of alluded a lot of things in his presentation, but uh, specifically what I want to think about is one, to give a cue into the future of Stake Wars, like post phase one, what is phase two's uh, ability to take the stake wars further down, right? So um, I want to kind of get a little more into like, what are you guys planning in terms of the next episodes for the stake yeah. wars. So I think we've learned a lot of lessons, right? We continue to learn as this is actually the third stake war. So we've gotten a lot of good feedback from the community. We've got some new tools we're building. We're looking at tools for auto delegation, managing stake, doing some things like that. So um, that's from kind of the organization side. And then, um, of course, as we continue to expand sharding, we're talking about more validators. So. We've got to bring them through the process of uh, onboarding them and, and helping educate them through the process. So that's kind of what will be in store for the next stake wars, kind of what we've been doing, but lessons learned and continue to apply and get better. Absolutely, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, for me there are two main lessons. The first one is technology changes, but human behavioral uh, design doesn't change. Yeah. So there's a lot of interesting game theory of when you introduce incentives to any situation, the humans may behave in ways that were not intended. <laughs> so I think there's a lot of lessons around structuring the competition in a way that leads to the desired outcome. Like we battle tested the code, but some incentives had to be tweaked along the way. So we've got a nice playbook now on how to optimize for future iterations. The second one, which I mentioned very briefly is when you look at the community aspect, it also requires commitment. Like we're really proud to be on the community side as builders and to be able to represent the stakers mm -hmm. and the validators. But community requires the commitment to show up and it's basically a full-time workload and you want to, you need to be aligned with the ultimate outcome to be able to do the sacrifices along the way. And I guess it's a message to everyone in the community to get involved, but also it's not just you know shouting loudly on Twitter; it's showing up and uh, doing the work. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, for linear like stake war is never just about in you know, onboarding more validators. I think like what's more like more like even more valuable for us is that we've heard a lot of feedback and we've received many good submissions from the channels we posted. I think like one is about um, validators uh, stats analytics. Uh, and the other one is about um, staking farm. Mm -hmm. but like those, I think those things are you know a very sort of you know core to the to the near protocol level, and especially staking farm, which is very unique to near. I think that's sort of you know like the real value of of, of stake war. So you actually get 
get, get, get the community involved and you sort of onboard more people to think about NIR and to create, and to create on top of NIR. And uh, yeah, we think that's uh, really the core value of Stake War. And obviously, we're going to you know, stay along with the, you know, with the progress of, um, of, of sharding, you know, onboarding more violators. And on the other hand, we're going to you know, keep building the community uh, yeah, and just keep you know, building around near, near staking and make it more, more powerful in the future. You know, that makes sense. George, do you want to add something? Or I can actually switch to the next. I actually want to say that yeah. um, going forward, the reputation will matter a lot mm -hmm. on near blockchain. And people will be staking to validators not only because there is a lower fee, but because this validator has some kind of a good reputation. And as our sharding progresses on its roadmap, it's not going to be just big players like here on a panel today who stake or, or, or become validators, but you're going to see enthusiasts participating too. And so the small time validators will, will fight for their reputation. Yeah. And they would want to contribute certain features and they would want to build the community and have some kind of multiplicative effect. And this is the, what I'm really looking forward for. That, that's, that's a very good point. I think we are looking at a lot of large partners, but I think the learning has been going forward more and more individual, uh, smaller set of groups, so, so we can decentralize in some way to um, have more validators, right, in, in, in terms of expanding on the decentralization approach. So uh, that totally makes sense, yeah. All right, I, I think um, from here, I kind of want to go into the realm of uh, the future. Like, what is it as builders can expect more? Um, uh, in specific to sharding, but much more than that, right? We talked about easily upgradable, bring any feature, and we will kind of parity match uh, like any retailer does. So uh, yeah, I, I just want to just double click on that more and, and talk about composability, which the questions comes on, hey, should we solve that on layer one or layer two? Where should that responsibility lie on? So if you have any commentary around that. Yeah, absolutely. Developer experience is sacred to near, mm -hmm. and as Henry said already, no one have even noticed that sharding phases have been launched because they didn't need to update their smart contracts. Yeah. And this hasn't happened randomly. We actually put a lot of thought into it. We knew from the very early days that we don't want to interfere with the already deployed smart contracts. Yeah. So we're going to continue developing in the direction of developer experience. And we're going to leverage all kind of integrations so that when you come to near, you don't need to learn anything new. There should not be, should not be, should, we should not have any barrier for the onboarding for people coming on near. And so that's where the integrations with other blockchains can w would come in because you would just either migrate or integrate. Um, the same goes for the virtual machines or the programming languages that we're going to support. So that's I think that you should be looking specifically forward for. Yeah, totally makes sense. And I think it's time to wrap up. Like, any last pointer, like, why any builders out here want to use specifically near uh, for building apps or just being validators community? So, just quickly, if you can go in rounds and. Yeah, I'll just go back to the key points. You know, if you're looking at developing on near, right, we've expanded the number of shards, we've increased, you know, the number of validators. That will continue to change and evolve, but it's no change to you as the dev. So, right, it's a simple interface, whether you're using Rust or JavaScript um, with front end development, you can come in and build on Near and not really have to worry about the tech. So, that, I think that makes Near very compelling and uh, scalable for developers. Many reasons to build on Near, but maybe specific to sharding and stake wars. I like that decentralization is very intentional as well. Mm -hmm. Like when you look at a network being decentralized, the nodes need to be both spread out geographically, but also politically. And being very intentional about reaching out to the community and enabling them to join the validator set, you will actually see a very meaningful uh, distribution of the near across many validators. And that really makes the network resilient. And yeah, it's just very exciting to be able to get involved at any layer of the stack. It could be a validator, a builder, a user, yeah, Stanley. Yeah, I think the next step for us yeah, is actually to, you know, to grow usage because uh, we've got the best infra, we've got the best community, we've got a very decentralized group of validators, and you know, now it's time to you know, make 100% of use of it, right? So 
Uh, and for us, we're going to keep facilitating that sort of the bridging process between the best infra to the most used infra. Yeah, so that's our vision. Excellent. George? So uh, from my perspective, one of the great advantages that, that you have on, on the your ecosystem and on your protocol is the flexibility that we have on the technology side to actually implement support and add features and add improvements to the protocol that are related to the applications you're developing. So sharding or JavaScript support or many other things that, that we've done in the past and that we still have planned in the future are examples in this space where we have the flexibility on the technology side to make things happen. And we are super, help, super keen and super willing to hear feedback from you regarding what are the things you would like to see inside the protocol and to find ways to make those happen. Max. So with Nier, the de developers that build smart contracts on the blockchain are not just the users of the blockchain, they're also the builders of this blockchain. So the earlier you join, the more you will be able to affect the roadmap of, of the Nier protocol. Many of the protocol features like precompiles today are actually a were in, uh, proposed by the contract builders. So that's your opportunity to come in and create exponential impact for the future roadmap of the near blockchain. Yeah, absolutely. Just to wrap up, it's, it's just amazing what you're hearing. I think if you really want to get your hands dirty, you have to come and start proposing and building. And as he mentioned, Ori is presenting NEP. It's, it's the way of proposing uh, and contributing the code base as well. And we really encourage you guys to start submitting proposals, or at the least, come to the Pagoda booth here. If you have any questions, comments, suggestions, we are happy to, to take anything. So we, it has to be completely community -able and we really encourage that. So one last note. So as Ilya mentioned, we go by KISS principle, which is keep it simple, secure, and scalable. So remember just that if you can't remember anything else. So thank you all for coming, and a big round of applause to the whole panel. Hey everybody, I hope you enjoyed the break. I hope you got to try some of the great food we have out there from different regions. I uh, really want to thank you for coming out and uh, joining us here at NearCon this year. It's uh, been a great turnout. I hope you're managing to keep dry out there. Um, so yeah, we have some great, uh, great panels coming up. I hope that you guys enjoy them. Uh, I want to introduce um, a young Jean. Uh, she's going to be speaking about crossing the chasm, how to make bridges safe. Hello. Hi. All right. Thank you, Marcus. And thank you all for joining us today on this discussion around making bridges safe. So I'd like to bring up uh, to uh, the stage our panelists for today. So let's go ahead and, if you wouldn't mind coming up. Um, we have Blas from Composable Finance, Kiddo from Aurora Labs, and Jess from Archway. All right, so I would love to give each of you like a minute to kind of introduce yourselves, what you do, and um, kind of what brought you to NIRCON. Totally. Um, so I can start because I'm sitting right here. <laughs> uh, my name is Jessica Solomon. Um, unfortunately, not Jessica Solomon. However, that would be pretty dope. Um, so I work on a number of different things. I actually started my career back in the Ethereum ecosystem. I was the first community manager at MakerDAO. Um, started at the launch of Single Collateral Die in 2017. Uh, since then, I've begun consulting, doing strategy, working on a number of different exciting projects within Web3. It's been awesome to see how the entire Web3 ecosystem has really grown, especially near and everything that's popping off at these festivities. Um, but currently, uh, I'm here working on a project called Archway. Archway is pretty cool. It's a smart contracting platform for Cosmos. Um, so basically, a way for people to deploy dApps and access Cosmos assets, as Cosmos is a large ecosystem with lots of different chains, so sort of a concentration of all that. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, hi, I'm Kirill. I'm uh, leading the Rainbow Bridge team uh, in Aurora Labs, um, building everything uh, related to the bridges, uh, to cross-chain interoperability, 
And yeah, like we are trying um, to build and we are, we are working really hard, or hard to have a bridge which is safe because, yeah, you know, like this is quite an issue. That's, that's why we're here on the panel to discuss this thing. Um, yeah, like I'm quite for a long time in blockchain uh, for many years. And yeah, excited to build these things and excited to be here on this great conference. Awesome. I'm Glass. I've been in crypto for some time. I started building a derivatives exchange on top of Lightning Network, then uh, moved um, to Ethereum, worked uh, on CK rollups. I'm currently leading the trusted bridges at Composo Finance. So we're working very hard to make this happen and working side by side with uh, Nier and very excited to be here and being part of this uh, amazing movement. Awesome. So thank you all for joining me this afternoon. Um, so obviously, this last year has been a little bit crazy. I mean, from Wormhole to Nomad to Ronit, according to chain analysis, roughly $2 billion, right? $2 billion has been lost to bridge hacks in the last year. That's an astronomical number. And yes, that's very crazy. But I feel like the media narrative is just you know, dominated by that. Um, obviously, you know, whether we're talking about like end users or builders, as we're moving towards mass adoption, like interoperability is inevitable, right? And so if we're thinking about it from that perspective of, well, it's something that's got to happen, um, I feel like the big question is, how do we make that interoperability as safe as possible? And so that brings us to our discussion today. Um, to kick things off, like I said, obviously it's been a crazy year. Um, I'd love to ask each of you, kind of, what have you learned from the recent, you know, high-profile hacks? Um, how are you guys kind of approaching the way you think about things and solve problems and build? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, in terms of a number of the high profile attacks recently, one of the things I've observed is it's often not a problem with the actual model. It could be as simple as a smart contract error. Um, however, a lot of these bridges have received extremely legitimate audits um, and have been verified. Uh, that being said, I'd say audits, while extremely important, aren't necessarily the silver bullet, the end all be all. Um, as someone that works on projects that cares a lot about the ecosystem and end users feeling confident and not terrified from these essentially terrifying hacks, I'd love to help put out more bounties for white hat hackers to try and exploit um, and find certain vulnerabilities before things actually come to market and we um, suffer consequences that could have potentially been avoided with some smart white hat hackers. Um, yeah, so, um, uh, you know, like a lot of bridges that were hacked, uh, they actually were having like a great team behind them. And yeah, as just said, uh, they had like some audits, but it's just not enough. And for some, for example, bridges for hacks that happened, um, like if we talk retrospectively, of course, it's easier to talk this way. Uh, some of the issues were because um, of the processes. So it's just not enough to have an audit because um, some of the hacks happened uh, exactly because um, like the smart contract deployment or upgrade went wrong. And it went wrong not, it just went wrong and it immediately hacked. So it was like this in the state for a couple of months until somebody noticed it. So I would say it's, it's about um, general approach if we talk how to make it safe. So let's compare to some uh, like real world uh, like situation. Like if we talk about some robust uh, like robust uh, fields like uh, aerial industry, usually if you want to build a plane, you need to go like through a million checkups, through a million audits. Uh, eventually, you have like safe flights, um, but uh, it comes like a huge value behind that. Um, so for building the bridge, from my perspective, perhaps they ideal approach would be like, let's say to use waterfall, uh, like technology to go from multiple stage from the design, iterate, and, but then just one bridge could take like five, six, seven years to build just because it's quite slow to iterate and the blockchain, unfortunately, 
um, you have no chance. If you, don't, if you build your product for years and years and you don't deliver anything, you have no chance actually to have it and nobody will use it. You will build the safest bridge, but nobody will use it for years and after these years. And um, like, from my perspective, we have like, basically two pro approaches to build a bridge and um, these are main ones. Uh, with regards to what kind of, let's call it consensus of the bridge. Um, so the most popular one is when you have multiple off-chain validators that just accept some transaction on one chain, they verify it with off-chain tools, and um, then they like mint some tokens on the other chain, and uh, most of the bridges work in this way. Uh, and the second approach is that, for example, we are using for the Rainbow Bridge is basically we are building light clients for every chain that is connected to the bridge. Uh, this makes a lot of sense from our perspective just because if you imagine just building some application um, on the chain, for you, you don't care about consensus because you, you are on the same chain and you verify something. So with uh, Bridge, if you build w like light client based, for you, it's the similar approach. You just know that this smart contract, it has a history of the other blockchain, and I can trust it um, as far as the light client is implemented correctly. So in um, some sense, it's easier to build with light clients in the sense that we don't really need to put like a lot of security, like um, of traditional security, of ensuring that the validator is not hacked, the uh, like keys are not compromised because it's trustless. It's uh, built on top of light clients, and you trust it, but it's trustless because anyone can participate and submit to that consensus. So, yeah, in some sense, building with validators, it's easier, but then it's harder to maintain. But here, if you build the proper one, light client, then you actually get rid of a lot of pain afterwards. Yeah, I think the, the main issue is that we are catching up with the technology in, in how the user need is evolving and the, and the constraints of the different chains. So some years ago, Ethereum was enough. Then suddenly, it was not enough anymore. Then new chains were developed. You have Nier as a great example. And then suddenly, you have a lot of ecosystems that are isolated. And then the need of connecting them came. Um, but these chains, in some way, they don't move as fast as the needs of the market. So then there was the need of bringing this technology uh, in a way that perhaps was not compliant with the chain necessarily. So these solutions arose, uh, the, the trusted solutions, that is the quick and, and dirty solutions that, that we've been using, that some of them have been working really well. But we, we started seeing that they have also limitations, uh, a lot of attack vectors, and even some setups that were more secure than other ones were also compromised. Um, so we, we realized that there's a need for standardization so that we don't reinvent the wheel all the time. Uh, a bit uh, what Kirill was saying in terms of like using light clients, but for that you need the different ecosystems to support that infrastructure. So I think like having this conversation and the need from the, the market being so big is, is actually forcing the chains on you know, giving this, this infrastructure to, to the builders, uh, the infrastructure builders as well, um, so to say. And, and I think in some other way, we need to agree. We need to take a, a page from the, the internet evolution and say, how are we going to commu communicate with each other? Let's agree on this. Let's say this is an efficient way to do this, and let's not talk again about this every time. Let's not build a new company about this every time. We don't talk about TCP. We don't talk about HTTP. It's a standard. We all agree. And then we build on top of that. So, so I think this is what's happening at the, at the moment. Um, and it's kind of converging. And, and all these hacks uh, are basically accelerating this movement. Thank you. So I guess I have a bit of a spicy question. Do you think that cross-chain vulnerabilities are just inevitable and uh, whoever wants to go first I can go first <laughs> I think yes I mean there's always a smart contract risk yeah. uh, 
It's always a human error, and there's always somebody being smarter than somebody else. Uh, the question is, how can we mitigate this? And I think this of, you know, white hacker bounties, for example, is, is a great way of mitigating these things. I think there's a lot that can be inno innovated on the, on the insurance uh, space. It's very, very little innovation still. Uh, so I think there's probably the best route moving forward is, you know, uh, mitigation and open standards. Yeah, I totally agree. I think vulnerabilities are in many ways inevitable and it's sort of our job to protect users and help discover those vulnerabilities before they happen. So generous white hat hackers. So if any of you guys out there want to receive some generous bounties, hit us up. Um, uh, from, I agree with guys, uh, for, though from my perspective, it's not just bounties that could help this. Uh, so we think, uh, like uh, in Aurora Labs, of, of about the bridge and about basically any question, like a multi-layer um, process of ensuring the security. So first of all, uh, like um, if you build some smart contracts, it's not just you deploy it. So basically, it's ongoing. The first stage of the audits of the bridge team itself, and it's been verified quite thoroughly. Uh, then the second stage, it's been verified by some other folks, like from other teams, like to take a look at it more. And only after this, we are coming to the stage, not even to the audit. We are coming to the stage, to the preparation of the audit. So you need uh, to prepare a lot of documentations. Uh, you need to write a lot of tests. And with regards to tests, um, we believe that it's responsibility of engineers themselves to cover it with the tests. So it's not like just a separate QA team. When you write some code and any blockchain related code, it's, it's security critical. So basically you need to put a lot of effort to cover everything with the tests, different ones, integration ones, unit tests. Uh, this is a quite a meticulous process. Only after this, when everything is prepared, it goes to the audit and not only one audit, and uh, you can never uh, like be just reliable just on the audit. You know, especially if some people, sometimes they just, they pass the audit and then, okay, we will want to add just one small feature, it's fine. But that's just one very, very small feature could introduce actually a vulnerability. And uh, so yeah, multiple audits are required, not just only one. Uh, preferably like from different companies uh, that are not biased already to the code. And then comes the thing with bounties, yeah. So with some of the bridges, with some of the hacks, we can see that they actually introduce bounties after they got hacked. So they are hacked and then uh, they are asking uh, like black hats, could you please return and we will give you some bounty. Unfortunately, this doesn't work um, usually. And so, yeah, you need to introduce bounties in advance. And for us, it was quite fruitful, I would say. So we paid out uh, the biggest bounty, uh, like the second biggest bounty in the blockchain space, which was like for six million. And after that, we paid like a couple more bounties, like resulting like in an insane amount of eight million of US dollars. And for white hats, this is like amazing opportunity to participate. It makes it easier because you don't need to, you know, you, if you like a black hat and you steal a money, then like basically you have an issue that these funds are frozen for years. You are trying to get not caught by legal, um, like different teams, uh, which are like intelligence teams, which are hunting for you. So it's better just select some project that have a good bug bounty program, and please be a white hat and receive like a huge reward, and uh, also not, not financial reward. You will get a recognition uh, in a public space. So yeah. Awesome. So yeah, if anyone is you know considering hacking something, you know do it for good. You know be a white hat, not a black hat. All right. So I guess for the builders, if you're considering you know utilizing a bridge. Um, what are some steps you should take to keep it as safe as possible? Obviously, like, 
you know, as you're building your project, you can't protect for everything. Like that's just an, inevit an inevitable truth in security, right? Like you can't protect against every single vulnerability, but you know, what can you do to keep it as safe as possible? Yeah, so um, basically, as I said, it's like a multi-layer thing uh, to make a protection, um, but also behind that, you really need to have a security team um, who is able uh, to quickly react to any incidents um, like 24 seven. You cannot afford having like just a weekend for security. Hackers will not wait until you get back to your work schedule. Um, so yeah, you need to, uh, really to have 24 seven someone who is on the call and who will be able to react quickly. You need to build a robust monitoring system. I mean, this monitoring system, they are not public. so. Uh, you will not get like, I don't know, like more user traction just because you built monitoring system. But this is an essential thing that you need to build just to protect your users. It could be invisible from the outside so that it's nothing happening. But you really need to build a robust internal monitoring system. And like, of course, ideal is some public monitoring too. So everyone is able to verify. Yeah, I think in terms of data analysis, there's a lot of things that can be done. I was the other day looking at a tool, not related to bridges, but they were monitoring system calls. And based on the pattern of access to a program, you could basically say, OK, this is malicious activity. And this can also be you know, done for anything, smart contract access or on-chain activity as well, where you can just say, OK, you know, this is the historical access uh, patterns. What is normal? What is abnormal? And you know, trigger alerts. Um, this, the, I think there's a lot that can be done on the space, uh, so it's it's really nothing really hurts. Yeah, like these guys said, I think in Web three we're all sort of working together on this stuff. So, uh, as someone that works on projects that would rely on bridges, um, we want to support those teams where we can and help discover what could potentially be risky for our users ahead of time. And then, of course, help our users feel safe so that they continue to be a part of the Web3 ecosystem moving forward. Awesome. All right, so I have one last question, and then we're going to open it up for a little bit of Q&A um, if we have some time. So I guess to wrap things up, what really excites you right now? Like, what's getting you motivated? Um, is there something you want to share about that you just like really, you know, like, just, it gets you up in the morning. Um, yeah, for sure. We, we all need reasons to wake up in the morning here and because we don't always have this awesome carnival going on with Ferris wheels and carousels. Uh, but, yeah, so one of the things that I'm working on, Archway, that I find particularly interesting and what we're entertaining is becoming sort of a hub for IBC assets um, from near. So that rather than having multiple different representations of like USDC, for example, from A through Z chain on IBC, it, there could be a sort of concentration of liquidity within Archway. Um, I would say that's one of the things that we should really focus is like, uh, from our vision, uh, it's really like the bridge. Uh, you need to put a lot of effort to make it trustless as much as possible. So the process of making it trustless, it's hard. I mean, um, you need, because you are building trustless, you need to ensure that any actor can part participate, but they cannot be uh, a malicious actor. Or if they are malicious, then they will not get through. It's like similar to the blockchain approach. I mean, on the blockchain, we trust to some consensus, whether it's proof of work or proof of stake, but it's decentralized. If we build decentralized bridges, well, then it changes everything. Uh, like with the blockchain, like another like evolution of the blockchain. Because like by default, blockchain, they are not interoperable with each other. And if we come to the question like whether they need to be interoperable, well, um, the people in the community, they say that it, they should be. Uh, like, it's, it will not work if you just need to stick to one chain, not anymore. You basically use like one, two, five chains, whatever. 
And uh, yeah, I mean, for the bridges, uh, I like uh, like one of the quotes. It's not related to the blockchain bridges, but it fits actually really well by American comedian Jerry Seinfeld, who was saying like, nobody wants to build a bridge. It's really, really hard. Uh, so, but we need to build it. So actually, community they are able to you know like get all the beauty and all the features of the blockchains of different blockchains to have like one ecosystem that interconnected that is secure so it's in some sense it's blockchain of blockchains for us i think a bit shared vision um composal what really excites us is to become invisible i think we we want this to get the best from web 2 in web 3 this idea of inter truly interoperability where the user doesn't really need to understand what's going on, what's going on under the hood, and things just work. I think when, when these panels you know, don't exist anymore, uh, our work has probably been done the right way, and then we can think of something bigger. Uh, but it's, it's a hard problem right now that we're putting a lot of effort onto improving. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, so big round of applause for our panelists. Thank you. Um, and um, we have just about like five minutes. If some of you want to come up uh, to ask a question, we have this mic right up here. Um, and uh, please feel free to pop up. Um, yeah, do you have a question? Yeah, I have, um, yeah, I have a lot of thoughts on this. The, uh, the gentleman in the middle that just suggested like a blockchain of blockchains, I actually work for that project that's been built. Uh, all the bridges are root cryptographically secure on both sides. Um, and the first bridge is uh, live on the Ethereum testnet now, and it goes live at mainnet in about two weeks' time, straight after the merge. The project's called Verus, V-E-R-U-S dot I-O. It means truth. Uh, the lead dev was the CTO of Microsoft for advertising, one of 22 technical fellows in the history of Microsoft. He architected and built .NET. Uh, which is the world's largest virtual machine and argues that that is the wrong design for blockchains. So just to go back a step, uh, if you use the company like Starbucks, for example, they're a perfect use case for Web3. They have a huge loyalty, uh, you know, branded loyalty uh, currency through their gift cards with billions of value that they can't put on their, um, on their balance sheet. But, but, it, but under a community currency, they could. Right? And, and if that community currency was fully fungible with Nikes and whatnot, and they were all interoperable, that would be basically the, the, the use case of Web3. So that's exactly what we facilitate. Um, but I don't think a company like Nike or like uh, Starbucks are going to participate in an ecosystem that has smart contract risk, that has MEV, that has front running, that has back running. So all of those things need to be dealt with before you're going to get proper actualization of Web3. And I think saying to a hacker that could potential, whose potential upside is you know, millions of dollars of value, hey, we're not, you know, you give up that value, but get the recognition and do it for the right reasons. I just don't see that happening. And you know, how much money should a company spend on audits? Like, it's very common for a company to do three audits and still there to be a smart contract bug. So, or, or you know, an exploit. Like, it, you know, how, much do they, how much should they spend of the money that they raise or that they generate or whatever to security if, if the underlying uh, protocol is flawed. So I would love to speak to all of you, but you basically outlined what we've created. It's been four or five years in the making, and it's, it's basically fully live at mainnet in the next two weeks. So verus.io, if anyone wants to look it up or speak to me, I'm around. Um, yeah, so if we talk about uh uh, if, if I get your question correctly, so, um, um, yeah, of course, if you build the bridges between, let's say, two different protocols, and some of the protocols, they have its own vulnerability, for sure it's, um, for you, a question, how do you address this? Uh, uh, do you want to add? Okay. Yeah, so, so what we actually do is, uh, again, it's beyond my technical understanding uh, the, 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 the once you get into the super technicals of this, but um, there are validations that happen on both sides that need to be, uh, uh, 
that then needs to be approved you know, b b before uh, the, the, the bridge can function. And it's not just trusting an oracle uh, or a smart contract that can be duped. It's actually root cryptographically secured. So I'm saying we, we've built the solution. I'm not asking necessarily the question. I'm just, you know, saying that, like, I don't think what you outlined with the, uh, the white hat program is going to work. And I think that, you know, people much smarter than me have, have come up with a really robust solution. And I'd love to share it with you. Come on. OK, yeah. Sounds great. Like you outlined, you, you, you described it when you told, when you spoke about, so when you spoke about a blockchain of blockchains, that's exactly what it is. And so anyone can bridge to Verus and every, anyone that does bridge to Verus has safe, secu um, and s safe interoperability with any other chain that the network touches. So the more people that bridge to it, the, the, the system itself is, is fully interoperable, but any other bridges that, so say, you know, Polygon makes a bridge, then, um, whatever, Solana makes a bridge, then Near makes a bridge. Now, now if you're a uh, polygon, you can now bridge to those blockchains as well, S super secure. Yeah, yeah I, I get it. Uh, it's nice to hear that you're building such a project. And yeah, um, with regards to your comments uh, on the white hat, on the recognition and funds, I think it actually makes a lot of sense because as I mentioned previously, if you're a black hat, well, you can get something hacked but it's not just like in the real world that if you stolen some funds that you will be able to use it. So some of the black hats we can see like historically they are holding their value like not moving for years. And uh, it depends on your goal. If you really want to commit uh, to like a good and bright future of the blockchain, but also you know like to get some recognition uh, to get like some financing, it's better to be white hat. In, like of course this depends a lot of the projects so if some projects they announce like a huge bounty but then they are not paying it out for some reasons then of course people will not uh, commit anymore to this program um, there will be it's it's hard to attract people to actually participate in the program but yeah you need to do your best and it's also a question that um, you need to try to ensure some funds of the users uh, like for example, we all we have some uh, projects on Aurora that are ensuring the use in France. Unfortunately, we were not able to find some partner who is able to ensure all the funds locked on the Rainbow Bridge. But yeah, if anyone uh, like is willing to participate, we will be open and really happy to have it. Yeah, I think what you just said is is interesting, and I think there's some validity to that. But ultimately, comes back to my last point about big brands just not going to trust the technology where there's those kind of vulnerabilities. And I think, you know, we need to look for better solutions. And, you know, as I said, I'm part of a community that I think has, has uh, actually solved this problem. So I'd love to share with you guys offline or, as I said, if anyone wants to speak to me, I'm around. Okay. All right, awesome. Thank you for that. Um, unfortunately, we're out of time. But if you have questions for the panelists, you know where to find them. Um, all right, well, I wanted to say thank you again um, for this amazing conversation. And obviously, if you all are interested in Bridges, these are some wonderful people to speak with. So thank you again, and one more round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you guys. Hey, thank each of you for coming up and discussing what is certainly one of the most salient topics in the space right now. Uh, definitely holding us back a little bit. Um, so up next we have uh, Lindsay Crawford of Proximity Labs, uh, along with some of the most exciting DeFi projects building on NIR right now, uh, discussing the topic of building a DeFi ecosystem on NIR.
Welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming to listen in on a little bit of what we're doing um, for Near DeFi. Um, joining me up here will be Arjun. Um, the CEO, is, it, is there an echo? No, OK. Um, the COO and head of partnerships of Orderly Networks, um, as well as Dira Bora, um, who is the co-founder of Stater Labs. Um, Didier Pironi is the product manager at Rev Finance, um, and Igor, um, multiple hats, founder and CEO of PEMROC, um, as well as works closely with Inc. C4. Come on up. Hey, my friend. So I wanted to start off with first diving into um, a little bit about your backgrounds as well as defining DeFi for um, members in the crowd that maybe are newer to the space or newer to the nuances. Um, so let's start with you, Arjun. I actually can't hear you. I'm sorry. Sorry? I can't hear you. You can't hear me? No. Okay. I know that they were having a little bit of an issue earlier with us. Let's see. How are you? I don't think they're able to hear. Are you able to hear now? Yeah, just slightly louder. OK. Um, so specifically, um, understanding a little bit of what you're building, as well as uh, your definition on, of DeFi. OK. So um, my name's Arjun. And really nice to be here with all of these guys. Uh, we are building Orderly Network. We're a modular order book DEX built on top of Near. Uh, we're looking to build uh, infrastructure, or as I like to call it, looking to build the plumbing underneath the DeFi ecosystem on Near. Great. And then Diraj, um, we'd love to hear a little bit about what you're working on. Hey, guys. This is Diraj. I'm one of the co-founders of Stater Protocol. We are a multi-chain liquid staking protocol. We build liquid staking, stake pools, structured products on top of staking across six blockchains. Uh, Near is the latest blockchain that we've launched on. And we have about $120 million in DVL today. And Didier, um, what are you working on at Ref? Yeah, well, I'm the product manager of Ref Finance, which is the first um, automated market maker within the entire NEAR ecosystem. And uh, yeah, we really, really glad to define ourselves as the one-stop shop uh, for DeFi um, products on NEAR protocol. Great. Um, and Igor? What are you working on at PEMROCK? Hi, everyone. I'm doing blockchain development and mm -hmm. Info, and we are the team who bring to you PEMROCK Finance, which is first leverage yield farming protocol on NEAR. Um, and just a little bit, Arjun, diving into DeFi itself, um, would you mind describing kind of your version of DeFi and then what Orderly is doing to, to solve? It's a good question. So the way I see DeFi is an opportunity for everyone to control their finances. Um, and that's a very high level and easy way and some, very, something very easy to say. Um, but coming back to your question in terms of what Orderly are doing, we're trying to create the efficiency and the structure and the infrastructure specifically for other projects to be able to supply ease of access when it comes to DeFi to mass market retail. Great. And then um, at Stater, what are you guys doing? Uh, for DeFi, I mean, liquid staking is, is obviously a very capital efficient, efficient enabling move. Uh, on an ecosystem like st on Near, where about 45% of, of the Near is staked, that's a lot of Near that's staked and not accessible to DeFi. So uh, with solutions like ours, we introduce capital efficiency, we introduce portion of that 45% of the Near staked, to also be able to interact with other DeFi protocols. And um, that's probably the single biggest uh, DeFi volume driver. Uh, and, and I see us as the enabler for that. And Igor, passing the mic. <laughs> yeah, well, I think one of the key value propositions of DeFi is basically how easily do you have access to the solution, right, without asking any permissions. And then that's the first thing. And then the second problem to solve is basically um, how do you provide, well, for REF, good prices, right? And I think for Orderly, it's also the same problem to solve because at the end of the journey, 
you're basically competing with you know Binance, Coinbase uh, for prices. So I think the first problem to solve is yeah how easily people do have access to your product, then how good your prices are, mm -hmm. and yeah if you have this I would say for I mean strong base, then then you can think about how can you attract you know uh, new users. So, yeah. Um, and for Arjun, if we're thinking about the general NIR ecosystem um, and staying competitive, how do you think NIR itself will attract more users specifically to DeFi? So it's for NIR ecosystem, it's like different. Every ecosystem is way different. NIR is good for DeFi mostly because it's fast, it's secure. Usually, it comes to user-friendly experience at all part of your building. Either you're a building builder or you're a user who just want to jump in DeFi, because like DeFi is pretty finance and decentralized. No single point of failure, fast transaction time, scaling, sharding, and it's still small town with family-like culture. You can pin people who are doing refinance, leverage token, uh, order book, uh, you want, you have everybody in the same place and it's still easier to access. If you will compare it to other ecosystem, everybody is like high level busy stuff. So NIR is really friendly, really fast, uh, good looking, nice account structure, easy to use. You can have mobile wallet, MetaMask wallet, ledger stuff, whatever stuff you want. Yeah, and Arjun, what's your take on that as far as um, the NIR ecosystem and how to attract additional users? So I think ease of access is the most important piece. Um, I think we're doing a good job as a broader ecosystem to, to provide those right of tools. But we're probably at the very, very early phase of what that lo looks like. My take is we're doing a very good job towards that. I'll, I'll use Ref as an example, right? Like, if you were to go and look at like the top DeFi protocols across the other largest chains, like some of them look great, but you look at the newest UI upgrades on Ref, like, in my opinion, they're flawless. Like, those are the things that are going to bring retail in terms of ability to be able to use it. But there's obviously a marketing job. Um, there's an infrastructure piece. It's all great having the best UI, but the back end needs to be fantastic and flawless as well. We need to de deliver the right type of product. Didier, as far as your yeah. response to that, specifically with Rev, obviously your UI UX is incredible. So um, how are you bringing users to use such a user-friendly application? Well, yeah, that's a good question. I, I think for us, there's really three pieces. The first one is, yeah, uh, basically prices, prices. How good are our prices? Then the second one is, obviously, the, the quality of the infrastructure, right? And to attract new users, we need to incentivize people to you know, try the product and potentially create a network effect. So I think liquidity is a big um, you know, answer within the ecosystem. Even, I guess, the ecosystem is turning uh, to a new point at the moment with less incentive, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but I think this is still a key piece of the ecosystem. And then how easy people can build on top of us to create new products, right? Like yield farming is such a great example, what Pembroke is doing on top of refinance, for example. But we have so many things, right? So uh, for refinance, from our perspective, it's you know the SDK, like the software development kit and how good it is. And then people can just create on top of us many verticals, right? So, but once you, once you bring like new users, then the question is, how do you retain them? Mm -hmm. How do you avoid, uh, you know, churn? And I think this is also like a good question, right? Because we are still so early. Um, I, I'm thinking about, I think at Ref we have in total more than 100,000 unique users since inception. But when you have a look at Instagram, at you know, the creation of Instagram, it was 100,000 users, new users per week, right? So I think we need to, to be humble compared to Web2. And it's still very early. But uh, yeah, we definitely need those numbers to go up, right? Um, and, and Igor, for your perspective, what does that look like as far as converting Web2 users to Web3? Um, and how do you do that within DeFi? Yeah, so while we onboard new users, there is like a lot of types of what they call new users. There is a users inside near ecosystem which just never interacted with our, with our protocol. There is a users in Web3 ecosystem which 
never interacted either with near or our protocol and there is users who are familiar with web 2 and they are familiar with all the world around them but never encountered crypto and for every this group there is a different scenario and there is a different approach while we're talking about people in web 2 they're familiar with financial system everybody use loans everybody use deposits everybody have some yields credit score ranking they can borrow capital they are familiar with trading infrastructure a lot of people made money on stock a lot of people familiar with robin hood and usually you try to show them that crypto is the same but decentralized more secure more transparent with everything controlled by you this is the main idea why we make this finance decentralized we do want to remove single point of failure and we want to make everything work on smart contract layer on validators layer on the layer of components which could not fail and you can use them with without any with without asking permission without asking for their working schedule except solana without asking like do i need to have passport nationality credit card whatever stuff you need to have access to your whatever seed phrase ledger any way you can sign transaction you can interact with near protocol and moreover you do not need to waste enormous amount of time it's really fast it's really transparent and it's really user understandable so how to onboard web 2 people to web 3 usually through education materials you just show them that this is the same but better you want to have a loan you go to a bank you provide some kind of collateral and you get additional money you want to have a loan you go to any lending protocol provide collateral borrow something against this is part of Pembroke mechanics you can provide your Bitcoin as collateral you can borrow Ethereum Pembroke USN put it in staking in farming rewards in ref finance make some yield have profit return your collateral you can do the same with orderly you want to have exposure to near but you a little bit shy so you go to lending protocol put I know you want Bitcoin as collateral you want uh, tether as collateral borrow near mm -hmm. go to air orderly execute your strategy based on it you can I know long short wherever you want to do but this is full financial system with same banks with same collaterals with same assets with same equity mm -hmm. but everything what going on controlled by you it's regulated in a good way it's do not have enormous limitation like you can just draw no more than 100 bucks from ATM machine in some country you need to go to a bank exactly in working hours you need to sign an enormous amount of papers like your whole family allow you to do this this is fast convenient transparent you just need to show to web two people what they can do with this because sometimes they just do not know it yeah I think that was a great explanation for onboarding um, as far as comparing near to other chains um, and, and maybe why you pick near to build on um, what does that look like for you guys when you were making your decision for ref um, you mean if we picked up why did we pick, pick up near correct so actually we didn't choose because uh, Helia the co well the founder of near started ref um, I guess because trading um, cryptos is potentially the second primitive after the blockchain right so you can send receive any token the native token but then the second use case is usually how can you you know swap one token for another so Ilya created ref uh, more than one year ago uh, to create I guess this first vertical so we inherited ref uh, but I guess yeah the near from a user perspective two things right mm -hmm. it's very cheap mm -hmm. and it's very fast like one to two second finality so the user experience is very different and from a builder perspective I would say well the community is really amazing and because it's I guess till the beginning there's a lot of communication going through uh, projects so you have access to orderly you have access to Pembroke you have access to you know neighborhood projects which makes it a very friendly ecosystem because it's still young right mm -hmm. um, yeah that's my answer then how are you building that community that you, you obviously it's going quite well but then how do you kind of continue that growth what does that look like well I'm not sure to have the right answer to that but I guess it's 
kind of a philosophy. And what I like within the near ecosystem is the give first approach. Someone is asking for something. Someone is asking for your help. Give first. And then we will see you know, what happens next. But I guess there is this uh, companionship, which is very, um, yeah, which I really like within the ecosystem. So just give first. When someone needs help, make sure you can provide you know, like a relevant answer to that. And that, I guess that's, that's how strong communities uh, can grow. Yeah, that definitely <laughs> builds trust. Um, <laughs> what about you, Arjun, for Orderly? Uh, how are you building community? What does that look like? So for us, Near feels like uh, the most obvious and easy fit. Obviously, Orderly is incubated by Woo Network from the expertise on the trading side. Uh, and then we get the expertise from Ilya and the rest of the, the Near team in terms of how we can scale a central limit order book. Um, no different to Didier's comment in terms of experience. It's fast, it's cheap, it's secure, and it scales. For us, coming back to your original question, the second one regarding like bringing users, the users that require the functionality for a central limit order book can't sit there and wait for a trade. Uh, they can't wait for optimal gas. They need to be able to do it in micro milliseconds. Um, Near's the clear, obvious choice to support that infrastructure, but of course, allow the experience for those users. Got it. Um, and as far as kind of going down the DAO rabbit hole, um, what does that look like for you building out a DAO with PEMROC? Um, do you have any tips or advice or kind of a roadmap that you've used yourself? It's only start of our story with DAO, but for it's a middle part between fully centralized to fully decentralized. Because right now, Pembroke still controlled by team. Yes, we are pretty fresh project. We fundraised literally this February, March. So we are on our road map and we are building something and to build everything fast. Yes, smart contracts is decentralized. Near is decentralized, everything's there, but there is still keys who can upload something, who can make changes to contract. And while you want to go fast and while you're building something, you need to have some kind of strong hand and leadership to figure out what you are doing and how you are doing. But for next period of time, I'm not the one who knows everything. And usually having a lot of smart head is way better than have one smart guy. So we want to have a DAO and we want to onboard the smartest people in industry or the smartest people who are willing to work with leverage yield farming. And we want them to make proposal, suggestion, decision, and we want them to communicate. Because right now, Pembroke team is the only team who are making decision, do we want to have USN on board or not? Do we want to have stable pools or not? Do we want to have stake at liquid staking? We want to have exposure to other currency. We are taking this decision based on our expertise. But our expertise is not a final amount. It's just like average, like for, OK, like smart people, but average smart people. Mm -hmm. And we want to make other people have option to put a suggestion, have option to vote something, have option to veto something. And there is like, it's not something in the like, wherever we want to do in 20 years. It's taking decision on an action-based plan. So we have community rewards, we have reward distribution schedule, we have down incentivization, and they can do it literally right now. So they want to work for some kind of marketing initiative, they want to develop something, they want to provide a grant for somebody, and it's just working. So it's part from centralized system to fully decentralized system. Mm -hmm. And the journey calls DAO. Yeah. What about you for Stater? What does that look like? Kind of your definition of a DAO and... Um, yeah. Um, well, I think DAO means different things for different people and different protocols. Uh, my opinion of a DAO is it's a place to be heard, right? It's a place for people to put their points out. Uh, unfortunately, I think DAOs across other blockchains in particular, they aren't where they need to be. Uh, they aren't serving the purpose uh, they ought to. Um, one of the things uh, that we have done at Stater, um, although we do not have an official DAO for it, is uh, you, you know we are always led by our community. We very very carefully listen to uh, you know what's happening on Telegram, on on Discord, uh, on Twitter, 
And uh, in fact, half of status features are driven by community at this point. So uh, that's, that's essentially my definition of DAO. How about for you, Arjun? The beginning piece is exactly how I feel. Like you have community members, token holders, core contributors, DAO contributors. They all fit within a DAO, but don't necessarily mean the same thing. Um, and it's really important, especially in the beginning, exactly as the Raj mentioned, is listening uh, to the community, um, but also not letting it slow you down. I think it's very, very easy to have a large amount of potential token holders or interested community members that can potentially guide you away or create noise, create chaos towards your sole goal. Um, I'm a very fond believer of uh, progressive governance, um, especially depending on the protocols, especially within DeFi delegated governance. Um, there are a lot more smarter people out there that can make better decisions for the protocol than me, as an example. I would love to delegate my voting rights in the hands of somebody else who can make those more informed decisions. And I think we love the idea within Web3 of being able to vote, being really, really small or really, really big and having that opportunity to vote. But we also have to be really thoughtful and really mindful about what that really means, especially when we're talking about the, the future of what TVL for a protocol might look like, future decisions, future listings, future direction of billion, future billion dollar companies. Um, and I think putting control in the hands of the right type of people, whilst, or at least, sorry, giving the opportunity to people to give control to the right type of people to the make more informed decisions is what I see as prog progressive DAO. I know we have a, f a few minutes left here. I'd love to hear um, what you think is missing in the near DeFi ecosystem. What, what do we still need to have builders doing on, on near DeFi? Users. We are like in users. <laughs> Who exactly. of you use Pembroke Finance? Just raise your hand if you use Pembroke Finance. OK, it's good. It's good. Mm -hmm. Who of you use uh, Ref Finance? It should be like way more. Uh, same people. OK, like I see you. and. I'm completely sure that a lot of you will use Ordle in future or liquid staking protocol. So we are like in users because this, this is not like full room. And we need to work hard about our like marketing materials, about our coverage. Because as technology, as base level, NIR is already good. There is a lot of unrealized potential. Technology is awesome. We need to push a little bit harder on marketing. We need to push a little bit harder about knowledge because I, I cannot compare it with like literally no competitors. Bitcoin slow, Ethereum expensive, Binance machine is a joke. You don't like you don't go with your friends validator. Solana is, you know, it it is what it is. Other blockchain like Terra Luna already dead. So Near is like the best blockchain to do something fast, scalable. Orderly is the only blockchain which is possible. It's near. Because uh, yeah. you do not you cannot run order book with small transaction. You will have transaction like 0 0.00, I don't know, like four zeros or yep. eight zeros. Like they will trade Satoshi. To move Satoshi and Ethereum, you need to pay like a fortune. You can do it on Binance, but it's not like, it's not decentralized, it's not secure. You can call your friends and do this, this, and this. Yep. So near is a great technology level. I'm really fascinated by the idea of having all the regional hubs to integrate with all this stuff. So we just need to onboard users. We are like in this. I agree. Yeah, I agree with Igor. I think we have like great use cases, new use cases like Sweat, you know, lifestyle, uh, world to earn. We have also a great infrastructure for institutions, for analytics, right? Um, I want to have a better understanding of my market. What's my user base? How much in average my user are spending? And we have those answers. And I think that we stand out, too, um, on, on, on the data and analy analytics side. And uh, yeah, I think we're getting better at solving problems, right? So uh, Ref Finance, for example, we that's, our, that's our near con surprise. But we just released uh, the concentrated liquidity feature one hour ago on testnet. Congratulations. So, um, so yeah, uh, I think we're getting better at you know optimizing liquidity. But there is one there is one piece that we cannot control, which is resilience. Mm. So Ethereum, they, you know, Ethereum was created 10 years ago. 
And people, well, this thing has been existing for 10 years. Near has been existing for two years and a half. So how resilient are we? And I think this depends on a function of time. So we just need also to, to be a bit more patient to demonstrate that near is a resilient ecosystem. Yes, I fully agree with that. Well, we are at time. Thank you all so much for your expertise. Um, and that's what's happening with near DeFi right now and lots, lots of good stuff to come. So thank you for listening. Okay. Thanks, guys. Cool. Thank each and every one of you for coming up here and uh, shedding some light on what you're building as well as uh, sharing your thoughts on the current climate of building DeFi on Nier. Um, up next, I would like to introduce another wonderful human being, uh, you may have heard of him, uh, who will be discussing the topic of the road to mass adoption, bridging NFTs to Web2 audiences, uh, Eric Troutman. So about a year ago, me and uh, a bunch of other people stood on a stage down the street and we talked about how the five-year goal for the NEAR ecosystem is to bring in a billion people. Um, at this point, we, we have four years left to go and we've made some progress, but we have a long way to go. Um, so what I want to talk about today, we've spent a lot of time talking about technology, which makes sense given that this is a core technology, but I want to kind of pop up a little bit and think a little bit more about who is actually going to be using this technology and look at things a little bit more from the user perspective. Um, so for today, uh, we don't have a lot of time, but I want to give a little bit of a high level overview of, of what is the, the landscape that gets us to consumer adoption, what are the components that we need to produce, and what are the things that we should probably be innovating in that we may or may not be doing right now. Um, so the first thing I want to communicate is that mass adoption is a growth problem, which I think is pretty obvious, but um, growth, growth is a word that comes up a lot um, in Web 2, but we don't actually talk about it a whole lot in Web 3 in quite the same way. Um, so as I mentioned, we had a goal um, but what this takes is you have to onboard a lot of users, and it's more than just onboarding users. You actually have to retain users as well. Um, and it's really easy to draw an exponential chart and, and say, oh, look what Facebook did, look what Dropbox did, and we'll do it too. Um, but this takes a lot of work. There are a lot of details that you need to get right if we want to make this happen. Um, and so I think my key point is that macro adoption is actually a series of micro-level battles. Um, and those micro-level battles occur in the funnels. Um, and so everyone has seen a user funnel. Your funnel might vary. Um, but basically, the, the point of the funnel, as you bring a user through your product, you obviously have to start with acquisition. But then there's an onboarding stage. You have to figure out how do you engage the users, how do you retain the users. And ultimately, hopefully, you can get a referral back up to the top so they're referring their friends and they're bringing in new people. Um, the problem is that every single stage of that funnel where you lose users has a multiplier effect and you can't actually retain users. We can't get to a billion users if, if any of the stages of that funnel across the ecosystem are leaky. And right now, we have a lot of problems. Um, luckily, Web3 has a few advantages. And NFTs is actually one of the, one of the coolest Web3 primitives. And it's one that I don't think is going anywhere. Um, because in a lot of ways, it's actually kind of the glue that holds together every stage of the funnel. Um, you can use NFTs for everything from acquiring new users. Um, for PFP projects, NFTs are basically you know, the, kind of the main event. It's what people go out of their way to, to capture. Um, but in a lot of other use cases, NFTs are kind of sidecars. They're, they're companion packs that you get alongside, say, purchasing a ticket to an event. But the cool thing about an NFT is that it, the reason why it's useful is it provides a future utility. It provides, it's sort of a container that has potential and potential energy. And at some point down the road, someone else can add utility to that NFT, or the sponsoring project can add utility to that NFT. And that's, that makes it much more attractive for the users. And so if you kind of look at every stage of that funnel, um, NFTs kind of show up at each of those stages, and they're useful to, to help bring the users through that funnel. Um, but one of the common misconceptions, and it's one that we've, we've gotten into a lot in crypto, is that acquisition is not the same thing as growth. Growth is sort of a, a full round trip cycle. Acquisition is just one stage of the funnel. Um, we've all seen Ponzi mechanics. It's one of the things that's worked great so far in crypto, at least in terms of top line numbers, right? Um, 
It's, it's effectively sacrificing everything from the retention side to create some sort of feedback loop where everybody gets rich. Um, it's free beer, free money, and um, it's worked out, it worked out in very interesting ways in DeFi. Um, and I don't want to hate on it entirely because I think it's actually, it does, it's, it's one of the most powerful forces for bringing in new users. And it actually convinces them, it's so powerful that it makes the users go through so much pain and suffering in the onboarding stages because the hook is so strong for, 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 for getting them in there because they're all, they all believe that they're all going to make some money on this. Um, but in the end of the day, it's actually sugar high growth because as we've seen again and again and again, you get these exponential curves up and what goes up comes right back down. Um, and in the end, it's not actually sustainable growth. So in a lot of ways, it's much more like a sugar high. And the people who come in through Ponzi mechanics generally aren't in it for the right reasons. You don't build strong communities, and the projects aren't creating this sustainable growth. Um, fundamentally, growth is actually a product problem. And I think that's, that's actually what I'm kind of excited about, is that in previous iterations, in previous years, we've spoken mostly about technology. And it's a lot of fun to be able to talk about product more and more. Um, and, and so a much more sustainable look at growth comes at its core from having good products. And so the ideal, the ideal product is actually a product that has, has a full good user experience through and through, and then, there's, and then there's a referral loop on the back end of that. Um, it's very simple. It's a very simple idea. Um, it's extremely hard to execute because in order to get this right, you have, to, you have to get a user to come in, you have to give them immediate value, and then you have to convince them that it's so worthwhile that they're going to get some sort of future value or some sort of social reputational value through bringing their network into the same product that they're willing to go out of their way to do that. And that's really hard. And, there, and again, like for every step that you make the user go through, you're losing people. You're losing, I mean, if the funnel is leaky, you're not going to accomplish this, and there's no way you're going to get a true viral growth. Um, so in a lot of ways, if we can unlock viral growth, that's, that's almost the holy grail for, for proving that we've, we're actually doing something right. Um, the problem is that onboarding is awful. Um, onboarding is, is the bugaboo of the entire blockchain ecosystem. Um, it's definitely the weak point that we all have. Everyone here has probably had the experience of either yourself or trying to walk through someone you know through the process of trying to use a new application. And it's difficult, it's painful, people don't understand what's going on. Um, in the end of the day, we all have to acknowledge, of course, that Web2 people just don't have time or patience for this. There's no way we're going to get to mass adoption if we, if we make them go through the same stuff that we have. But the good side is on the, on the bottom end of the funnel, blockchain in Web3, it has a lot to offer on that retention side. It has a lot to offer for long-term engagement. And that gets back to that idea of NFTs as being sort of long-term value holding utility engines. Um, because in, it, it's kind of that, uh, you get back to like, why are we using blockchain at all? And part of that is you could, it allows you to build the, these permissionless um, value stacks where other people can create value for your users just because they're holding your NFTs. Um, and that's really cool. Um, but we have to get people to that point. Um, so I guess what I want to run through quickly here is, is like, what, what does it take? Like, what do we need as an ecosystem in order to start to unlock some of these things? Um, and so I think basically you need incentives, you need components, and you need the right UX. Um, the incentives is not something I'm going to spend a lot of time on because that's going to vary depending on the product. Um, so really, in a lot of ways, that's an entrepreneur's problem. It's fi figure out what are the incentives that make your product something people want. Um, but components. The components that we need are essentially like the shared infrastructure that allows us to even build experiences that people can use. Um, and that's, that's basically about unlocking builders so that they can actually create good experiences. And then UX is about unlocking the growth so that users can actually use those experiences, which is a little bit different, subtly different. Um, so to start with components, from my perspective, we'll know that we're successful as an ecosystem in our components when a hacker can drop into a hackathon and by the end of the weekend, they will have mashed up a bunch of stuff, dropped in a bunch of code snippets, and they have a, an effectively a production app by the end of a weekend. And this, this sort of takes you back to the old API days, right? Remember when Twilio was out and Stripe and all these other things. And suddenly every hackathon, it, it, went, from, it went from struggling with DevOps to like now hackers are actually building real applications by the end of the weekend. I mean, this was maybe 10 years ago. Um, and, and so from my perspective, like that's where we need to be uh, if we're going to be successful competing with Web2 uh, and, and, and sort of building alongside Web2 to get where we want to go. So there's no way you can read this slide. Um, <laughs> but, but, but the point is, is, is sort of 
laying out all the little pieces, all the little components along the way, and this will be available online. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll be putting this up on Twitter in, in a blog post. Um, but if you look kind of from the top left to the bottom right, it's basically that as a user travels through, through an application, they end up touching a whole bunch of these different components. So on the top left, you're going to see things like NFT minting and claiming and distribution, and then they get, the user comes in and they onboard, and then we need to figure out how do we create them accounts? Are we creating semi-custodial accounts? How do we get them um, to use those accounts for a single sign-on? And then as we get deeper, you get back to the back end of more less on the marketing side and more on the community management and engagement side, and you get things like DAOs and, and token gating access and things like that. Um, and the point is that when we talk to when I talk to app, uh, apps that are, and teams that are building across the ecosystem, everyone has some sort of pathway through each of these components that that constructs their app. Right, so like if you're a PFP project, you need to make sure that you get NFTs in the hands of your users. So that means they need to either buy those NFTs on a primary market, they need to, to buy them on a secondary marketplace, you need to get them a near account somehow, you need to get you need to make sure that they have access gating for some sort of community. Um, and then on the back end, maybe that community is run by a DAO, maybe it's not. Um, same thing, fan loyalty. It's a very different type of use case. It's more of a, um, a Web2 crossover use case because obviously this already exists in Web2. And, but you have kind of the same principles. You want to get NFTs minted alongside um, something that the, the, the fans may or may not already have. Um, you want to make sure that they can claim those NFTs. Um, these are more Web2 people, so th ideally you're creating them some sort of semi-custodial near account. Um, and then down in the bottom, you want to make sure that as they take social actions, sharing, um, something that adds value to the fan loyalty perspective, that that's being recorded, um, and that that then sort of feeds back into um, adding value to the NFTs that they've already had. Um, and then finally, you get to some, some much bigger use cases, and it uses pretty much everything. So if you look at, um, like, th there's an application on Near that, that is building um, essentially for the, the movie industry, uh, sort of a crowdfunding platform where people can, can buy in, um, they get access to a DAO. They, it's an NFT that unlocks access to a DAO, which gives them access to creator rights over time. And, and like, this, this, this takes everything. Like, you, that application, like, literally needs every single piece of the stack in order to be successful. The problem is we don't have all of these. And so builders across the ecosystem right now are basically re reinventing the wheel left and right. Um, so, so it did kind of a, uh, a color-coded heat map of, of all the different pieces of this and kind of where we are. Um, and some of them we have, the NFT minting and, and claiming, that's something that we do at Satori. Um, but as you go down on the back end, there, we have a lot of missing holes. There are a lot of things where some teams have created useful tools, but maybe they don't have good UX, maybe they don't have documentation, maybe they haven't open sourced it. Um, and then way down at the bottom, um, th there are some things that we just don't even have in terms of like ways, ways to contact people who have NFTs. Um, actually, just, just two days ago, I think uh, Eugene and Vadim put out a, a messaging protocol prototype uh, for, for contacting NFTs, uh, NFT holders. But um, fundamentally, it's still an extremely difficult uh, problem to solve. But, or, or rather, it's a problem that, that hasn't been solved yet. Um, and I think one of, my core, one of my core messages here is that a lot of this isn't necessarily blocked by the technology. It's just blocked by, we need people to build it. Um, and each of, these, each of these squares effectively is a business. Um, and you know, sometimes it's, it's better as a library, sometimes it's an SDK, sometimes it's, it's supported by a SaaS style business, and maybe all the way at the top there's a no-code tool. Um, and maybe, maybe there's a no-code tool that actually pulls together a whole bunch of these components. Um, but effectively, like, we're, we're missing big pieces of that. Um, but another thing that's, that's worth highlighting is that not everything is about building components. Um, we also need to fix our UX. And UX is, is not something that requires um, deep development or deep research. It's something that uh, oftentimes just requires us to think differently um, and, and, and I guess step out of ourselves from a Web3 context. So if you look at onboarding someone, uh, going back to that problem of what does it feel like to onboard your friend, the, the typical way of doing this right now, and I'm very grateful for all, all the wallets that are built across the ecosystem, but my hope is I don't want my friends to even have to touch a wallet if they... If they if they're trying to come on. But right now, we, you go to a website and then you get bumped off to a third-party website and the user experience is very broken. Um, we're moving into a world where things are more semi-custodial, which is, which is a much, much better improvement, which is essentially the application 
essentially builds a wallet for the user without them really knowing on, the, on, on their behalf. Um, and there's some sort of shared key ownership. And then they can hand off that wallet to the users uh, after, after the user is finally ready to receive it. Um, it's a much better experience, but it still doesn't solve the, the core problem. If you think about what does a user actually want, the user doesn't care about wallets, as, as we know. They don't care about anything Web3 web related. They just want whatever it is the value that you're trying to give to them. Um, and so I think what we need to think about is like the wallet is effectively a paywall. It, it, it's the same amount of pain and suffering as you go through in a Web2 app when you hit the paywall. And so if we start to, to, to embed that thinking, then it starts to be, oh, man, like, how, how, do we, how do we work around the idea of like, most of our users shouldn't even have to touch that paywall at all. Um, and so what we really need to do is, is make sure that the only people who hit that paywall are the ones who, who are exceptionally motivated and are being given exceptional value. And everyone else should basically have a freemium, a freemium experience. Um, and so one of the things I wanted to communicate a little bit is that oftentimes we talk about the spectrum between custodial and non-custodial as, as being it. Um, but that's not entirely true. There's a lot of things that you can do when you start breaking out of uh, playing with the technology at all, and you start faking things. Um, this is sort of the old man behind the curtain approach, uh, which is that, that even beyond custody creating accounts on behalf of users and things like that, like what if we didn't even give them the NFT in the first place? What if we didn't even create an account for them in the first place? What if we faked the entire experience until the very last possible moment? And, and, and obviously, and the pushback on that is like, well, hold on, why are we even having a blockchain if all we're going to do is just fake, fake the entire experience and, and put it in a Web2 database? Um, and you obviously have to deal with some security implications. But this comes back to that whole idea, which is like, if we fundamentally believe that a blockchain is actually creating value long term, it is in fact valuable for users long term to hold these NFTs, then we have to put our faith in that. And so it's OK, I think, to fake a lot of these things on the front end as long as we've given the user enough value eventually that they're going to want their Web3 account. They're going to want the NFT. They're going to want whatever it is that, that we're offering them. Um, but until then, like, let's, I would actually love to see people experimenting more with faking everything possible. Um, we've, we, I have seen a lot of experiments where, where only Web2 users have been targeted. They've never been communicated every, anything to do with Web3 except the word NFT. Um, and it was actually very successful. The, a lot of users joined this. A lot of users shared. A lot of users got involved. And there were no wallets at all. Um, so, so clearly, th there are things here that users want. Um, and clearly, they're being blocked whenever we actually step in front of them and say, hold on, this is, we've got a paywall here. You have to set up a wallet. You have to do all this stuff. Um, so I would love to see more of these experiments with how much can we fake until we get to the point where it's worth uh, creating wallets for users. Um, the cool thing is, like, we're obviously here at NearCon, um, and, and this is the right technology to be able to do all of this stuff, um, because not only is it about scalability and cost, but the account model makes it very, very easy to do permissioning, uh, so, you know, whether it's permissioning individual keys, whether it's swapping accounts securely and things like that. Um, so like, out of the box, if there's going to be a blockchain, that when you're done faking it, it's time to su swap in that blockchain and make sure that, that, that the user has what they need. Like, this is the right one. Um, so, th so I am very excited about that. Um, we do, I just think there's a lot of work that we can do on the UX side before that point. Um, and so just a quick, quick note about Satori. Um, I mentioned it. It's, uh, so Satori's mission is actually very simple, similar to the NIR mission, which is why we've, we've actually run into so many of these problems, um, because what we're trying to do is to bring in the next billion people and to help grow and engage audiences. So we, we tend to exist up on the, on the marketing end of that, of that funnel. Um, but when we talk to, when we talk to uh, potential applications who might implement our API, Oftentimes, they're, they're one of two things happen. Like either they say, "Hold on, like why why should I use an N like yes, I want to use an NFT, but like how do I do that? Like how do I make this valuable to users?" Or on the other side, they say, "Oh great, you solved like 10% of the problems that I have, but I'm but my my dev team has to build out the other 90% because we don't have components in place." So my hope here today is to highlight that other 90% and say, please builders come in and, and, and fill in those components because each of those components is another business. And I would love to be able to work with all those businesses and, and say like, yes, you should use Satori here, but you should also use these other six products and, and mash them up in, in, into, a, into a full app. Um, and then on the other side, that frees us up to, to, to run more experiments and, and act more like a growth lab um, to start showing the value of NFTs because again, so much of this is about, like, if we're going to prove growth, if we're going to prove, uh, like, a long-term adoption, 
we, we, we can't be spending so much time in the infrastructure. We have, to be talk we have to be spending more time on the top end looking at users, talking to users, and trying to get users to come in and trying to collapse the steps and trying to, to make sure that we can create viral loops and viral hooks. Because again, that's really the only way that we're actually going to hit an exponential growth curve on any of this stuff. So, so in terms of specific calls to action, I mentioned incentives is really kind of the entrepreneur's problem. Um, but for the components, Again, each of the components I highlighted are basically individual businesses. So you, you can move this from a hackathon project that, that creates an open source library to you know, probably in, in a month you can, you can get a, a micro grant, turn that into a, 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 a small SDK, get a round of funding, and suddenly you have yourself a business. Like I would love to see more of that across the ecosystem. And so please go, go to the foundation, get grants, uh, uh, do, do whatever you can to, to put those components together. It's not blocked by technology. It's blocked just by builders. Um, and then on the UX side, uh, this is about hackers and product people, growth hackers, um, really just tr break, at, break out of the mental model, break out of the mental box of it's a, it's a spectrum where we always have to touch the chain to like, let's fake more stuff. Let's run more crazy growth experiments that don't touch the chain until the last minute and see if that's actually a better and more viable and more sustainable funnel for bringing users in who then will be much more long-term engaged when we do finally bring them into the fold with a, with a real near account, with real NFTs. So once we unblock all of this, once we unblock the builders to make things faster, once we unblock onboarding to make users go through smoother, um, then I think we can actually unlock the growth that we're all here and all excited to take part in. And maybe in the next four years, we will, in fact, be able to get to a billion users. Thanks. Awesome speech, Eric. And by the way, make sure while you're here, you check out Proof of Memories, which is Satori's new uh, NFT concept debuted here at NearCon. Um, we're now going to break for 15 minutes. Uh, make sure you check out the ecosystem partners if you haven't already. Grab some awesome food, and we'll see you back here in 15 minutes. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Nightshade stage. Next topic today is an absolute favorite of mine. It's gaming. Gaming in the Web3 in the Web3 space. So Jun Aeyong Jun will be moderating this one. It's called Onboarding the Next Generation of Web3 Gamers. All right. Well, I mean, I'm also a huge fan of gaming. Um, I think, you know, especially as we're thinking about mass adoption, I think gaming is an easy win, you know? It's an easy win. It's an easy way of kind of, you know, providing a gateway for the next, you know, like batch of users. And so um, I'm really excited to be moderating this talk today. And so I'd like to bring up to the stage, um, let's see. So we have Sasha from Human Guild and Hugo from Play Ember. Yeah. All right, round of applause. All right. So, you know, as I was alluding, I think there is such a huge opportunity with gaming in the Web3 space. I think we're still really early. I mean, I think that phrase is used across the board, right? Yeah. And we are very early, but I think with gaming, it's even more so, right? Um, it's such a complicated and kind of involved process of building a game. And so, um, you know, I guess I wanted to kind of open it up by asking you both, um, what do you feel like is the current experience for users, uh, as well as kind of like from the developer side? What do you think the experience is like building games in Web3? Sure, sure. So from um, well, our plan, but we're a mobile game studio, um, so we're used to kind of mobile game development. Um, so for us, um, at the moment, Web3 game development is a, is a lot more difficult than usual mobile game development you kind of don't need to deal with any interoperability or uh, game tokenomics. Um, so actually, it's quite easy to ship a mobile game. Um, 
and we've kind of, well, for the last nine months, we've kind of worked on the, the Web3 side, which has been a real learning curve. Um, and I think uh, a, a lot of mobile game studios are trying to do the same. Um, but I think the more and more people, people learn, um, yeah, it, it's kind of getting easier and the infrastructure's building up and, uh, and making it easier. What about you, Sasha? Yeah, I, I agree that uh, uh, it's very challenging to build blockchain game. Uh, it, it comes with trade-offs. It takes a particular mindset for people to embark on something like this. I think building games in Web2 space, a lot of things are figured out, be it for PC or web or Steam or mobile. But also the downside of building in Web2, gaming, it's extremely competitive. So even though things are figured out, there are best practices established over the course of a decade or two, uh, it's very, very competitive. And so the Web3 is kind of like opposite of that. It's like nothing is figured out. There are additional complexities that Hugo mentioned. Um, you kind of need to build a fun game still. That's the most important thing. But you also need to create open economy. But you also need to make sure those two things balance. Uh, economic game not going to become the main game. It's still the focus is on the game. You need to deal with legal. You need to figure out how to go to market, uh, which is incrementally and with a community, which is different from Web2 space. It's like a lot to figure out. No best practices established for none of these things. But on the other hand, it's also not competitive, meaning that if you launch something of value, likely you'll see a lot of people that care on day one. And because we have a near ecosystem, we have a lot of near wallets like eagerly waiting for applications to launch generally, but also games to launch. People are like, really waiting for launches. Yeah. Amazing. So I actually got a little ahead of myself. I wanted to give you both an opportunity to kind of introduce yourselves, as well as kind of talk about what you do and what's bringing you to NearCon. So uh, Hugo, if you would like to start. Yeah, cool. So I'm uh, Hugo, CEO at Play Ember. So yeah, we're a mobile game studio. Um, we have about uh, 8 million monthly active users across um, Apple and Google Play. Um, and we've kind of worked with publishers in the mobile game space. And our, our games are, uh, you categorize them like hyper casual to hybrid casual, probably. So games with really low CPI, cost per install, um, but they scale quite easily. So we kind of get big numbers, and that's what we want to bring to near. We want to take those Web2 players, and we've kind of built a, an infrastructure, a Unity SDK, which is what most mobile games are built on. Um, and basically a, a, an add-on, so you add it into the game. Uh, it takes about an hour, uh, so reduces a lot of the complexities that I kind of went through earlier, and lets game studios just concentrate on making games. Um, yeah, so that, that's where we hope to kind of mass on board um, a lot of people to near. Amazing. And Sasha? Yeah, um, my path to to Nier was uh, through France. So I uh, actually started working in Nier on almost the day one of Nier existence in August of 2018. I used to work in a database company, was one of the co-founders of Nier. One thing led to another, uh, joined it very early. Mainly in the beginning, I was talking to the market. So we had mostly developers building the blockchain. Uh, it took, in 2019 alone, we rebuilt blockchain three times. Uh, and we only have had two people on the business side, Eric and myself. I was focusing to talking to the market. Uh, that helped quite a bit near refocused on usability away from just scalability uh, through feedback from blockchain gaming studios, actually. Uh, and then fast forward to today. So I started Human Guild last year. It's one of the spin offs from Nier ecosystem. Uh, a lot of people, generally speaking, from early Nier team. Uh, br broke into small kind of like startups, so different uh, pieces of the ecosystem last year. We were the first ones. So we roughly in summertime of last year, we started focusing more and more on gaming. So we were more generally sp focusing on non-DeFi applications on near all kinds of creator economy applications. But we saw organic interest in gaming on near ecosystem last year in Paris, in one of the NFT marketplaces on near We saw last summer roughly 12 or so uh, creators who didn't have game development skills, but they really wanted to build something like a game. They were building like very simple card games, essentially. And we wanted to double click on that. We thought that there is something there. There is organic interest in this. We went to game jams. Game jams are kind of like something similar to hackathons, but people build games instead of anything. And so through working in game jams, we attracted a lot of independent game developers to New York system. Then we did some YouTube cross promotions. 
and slowly started started getting more and more uh, uh, studios, gaming studios, not just independent game developers, but also game studios interested in building games uh, on Nier. And so now, now work with 50 or so games on Nier of different stages of development. Uh, you can see some of them in a the gaming arcade. Uh, we have 16 or so games uh, available to try out in a gaming arcade. That's for people who like interested in, in trying them out. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you for that. Yeah. So, I mean, you both have kind of alluded to like the platforms that games are built on. And obviously, mobile is very hot in Web3 right now. Um, but obviously, gaming on mobile is a very different experience um, than, you know, maybe using like you know, like checking your portfolio on mobile versus desktop, right? Like to feel like the entire kind of the way you interact with the game is different. Um, but I guess my question to you both would be, do you think that mobile is key for gaming? And um, I guess thinking about kind of what you were mentioning, Sasha, like the kind of experience between mobile, PC, and web, um, both from a developer and user's perspective, um, what would you say is kind of like something that maybe we should even prioritize? Like, what do you think is a maybe um, like low-hanging fruit that we can kind of tackle first? Yeah. Um, I would say mobile is a very important channel for, uh, for game developers to consider. A year ago, uh, majority of people were too afraid to try mobile. They were building things for web. It's still, it's still a lot of uncertainty in terms of how to deal with Google, how to deal with yeah. Apple. Uh, like crypto industry will have to kind of together collectively figure it out together with those two, uh, two entities that control majority of the mobile distribution. But I think mobile is where a lot of gamers are, obviously. It's not just mobile, of course. I, I play some console games. It, it's not to say it's less challenging, figuring out how to get a crypto game launched on Sony, PlayStation, or Xbox is still kind of also very much open open question that n n nobody ha has done it but i think mobile represents this really big distribution opportunity yeah I, th I think it's um a question of the end user as well so i think um kind of crypto or really hardcore gamers probably look at mobile games as they're not really games uh so they would be more open to um to kind of web3 desktop um and i think that's probably where you'll have longer session times and everything like that um, but yeah, in terms of mass market, I think mobile is yeah certainly the, the lowest hanging fruit. Awesome. Um, I guess you know as we're kind of talking about you know the, the users and kind of onboarding this next batch uh, right of gamers, where do you think these users are? Going are going to come from? Like, where do you think these gamers are going to come from? Do you think Web2 natives are going to move over? Or do you think they're Web3 folks who are just going to get into gaming? Like, I'd love to hear both of your yeah. thoughts. I, I think that's a really um, <laughs> kind of important question or a, a hard one to answer. So I think uh, decentralization is great, uh, but it makes distribution so hard. So uh, I suppose we, we've kind of cheating in a way in that we're getting our users through Apple and Google and then kind of converting them from there to Web3. Um, we're kind of dabbling with the idea of basically like a treasure hunt or loot boxes within our games. So say a PFP collection, say oh, we want to put uh, 20 ASACs into your game and we drop them uh, across all our games and then we think lots of Web3 users would actually come into uh, like a, a Web3 mobile game to play the game and search for these PFPs. So I think, I think it can work both ways, kind of Web2 to Web3 and Web3 to <laughs> Web2.5, maybe. Um, but yeah. Cool. Yeah, I, I agree it will be a little bit of both. I think when it comes to Web3 gaming, it's still extremely early. The biggest uh, blockchain games today they have like 200,000 uh, wallets which is act active wallets uh, on a monthly basis I think which is good uh, but it's still like looking at the traditional gaming it's in millions hundreds of millions some some games even probably have more than that so I think um, I think we cannot rely on web3 gamers alone just because how small the market it is it's also fragmented it's kind of split across different chains and we don't have like really good abstraction layer yet or interoperability uh, existence. So I think it's a little bit of both. Uh, but I agree with Hugo as well. It's a really good idea to uh, think about NFT communities, for example, who are looking for 
providing utility for, for, for their communities and building games or virtual worlds for those is a really good natural step. And then on another side, uh, Web2 uh, Web uh, gaming studios coming into Web3 should be doing a lot of NFT drops, should be doing Web3 native kind of go to market. Awesome. Um, so we have a few minutes left. Um, I did want to ask, obviously, you know, for all the the builders who are interested in getting into gaming in Web3. Um, do you have any advice as they kind of consider, you know, if they want to like get involved, um, ways, you know, in which maybe that transition can be easier? Um, I would love to hear what you might say to them. Yeah, um, uh, I'd say probably just get started, kind of get, get stuck in because it's, um, uh, in Web3 more than any, uh, any other thing I've, done kind of over my career, it changes like weekly. Um, so I think you just need to get started, kind of get, get your head down um, and probably n not be too precious to kind of, even though you've done something and it's really cool for the last month or two months, actually if, if now that's not the way to go, you, you kind of need to pivot and just kind of take that you're learning all the time. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, important pieces are in terms of where to get started. Um, uh, so one is figuring out funding is extremely challenging, like navigating fundraising in gaming is challenging to begin with, but in the current market conditions is, is hard. So that, that piece is like needs to be at some point figured out because it, gaming is very capital intensive. I'm not saying like there are like perfect answers for this, but like figuring out what's your funding path for like multiple years is important one to focus on. And another piece is like money is probably secondary to Everything else, what, what I mentioned, how, how to go to market, how to build economy and, and things like that is a lot more important for success. They are what we do at Human Guild, we're trying to get founders to help other founders. So essentially build collaborative community that doesn't think of themselves as competitors, that thinks of themselves more as there is a lot to figure out. We need to all figure it out. We can speed up the amount of figuring this out by talking to each other. It was similar to how Near itself was uh, built in the beginning in a very collaborative approach. So there is like whiteboard series that Nier did on YouTube by talking to a lot of other layer ones and layer twos. And there was a lot of ideas and cross collaboration born out of it. For example, Nier borrowed some ideas from Polkadot. Uh, Ethereum 2 borrowed some ideas from, from Nier uh, back then. And so similar approach we're trying to cultivate with founders. If you figured out like sustainable economy, how to build it, do not treat it as a secret sauce. Yeah. Uh, talk to others and kind of like help each other. All right, awesome. So we're down to the last minute here. I'd like to hear from both of you in 30 seconds each, what are you most excited about? Like what excites you when you wake up in the morning, you're like, yes, this is something that I'm ready to see. Um, well, we're really excited to bring blockchain tech into, into mobile gaming and kind of really uh, get the perfect mix of Web2, Web2 kind of usability and ease of onboarding. Um, and Web3 interoperability, ownership, and everything like that. Awesome. Yeah, awesome. for me, it's uh, what motivates me is um, founders succeeding, like other creators succeeding uh, in a space. I think there is a blurry line between who is creator and founder. It's like, uh, but, but I think seeing those people successful over time is like what motivates me. Awesome. So obviously, you know, huge thanks to both of you for your time and your thoughts today. Um, obviously, gaming, it's hot. Um, if you guys have any questions, obviously, Hugo and Sasha are available to kind of take your questions at the end. Um, but yeah, thank you both so much. Thank you. Right. Thank, thank you, you so thanks. much, Hugo, Sasha, Ayung. Everybody here, if you're an avid gamer, do check out the gaming section, the Gamers Lounge, and test some of our great projects on Near Ecosystem. Hi friends, we're here to talk about interoperability. Excellent. Um, more specifically in the context of Polkadot and Nier. Um, I'm Ashley Tyson, I'm with Hypersphere. I'm a co-founder of Web3 Foundation, so I helped launch Polkadot. And then I worked with Nier Foundation to help launch Nier. And now I run a VC fund called Hypersphere. Um, we've invested in Axelar. Um, and this is Jason from Axelar and Sheldon from Octopus Network. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about keeping your friends near. Um, but maybe we can start by the both of you kind of giving introductions to your projects and what you guys are working on. 
Yeah, absolutely. So I'm Jason. I lead BDT here at Axler. Um, you know, Axler on a very high level is a blockchain that connects other blockchains. How Axler differentiates itself is that we're more than a bridge. We're able to move any payload, call smart contracts across any chains, and because of that, we believe we enable a whole new world of possibility. You can build now true cross-chain applications like cross-chain swaps, cross-chain lending, on top of Axler's decentralized and permissionless infrastructure. Cool. And Sheldon, tell us about Octopus. So Octopus Network is kind of like a uh, hybrid layer zero. It's a bit of an unusual play to say, hey, we like the relay chain. We like that secondary execution environment, but also liquidity is necessary. That's how I usually compare Polkadot Cosmos. We're fusing that solution on Near to use Near as a single execution environment for substrate chains, same format as Polkadot. But of course, they need more than that. They need um, features. They need things that work for their sovereignty. So they have the ability to bring up their own bridges, which we're going to be uh, launching earlier this, uh, sorry, later this year. Um, we're deploying an IBC relayer, pallet, and library that people will use to talk to other ecosystems that doesn't have to just be Cosmos. OK. So we should talk about those bridges in just a minute, because when I was told that we were talking about building bridges between Nier and Polkadot, I was just like, Do we have, did I miss the bridge like between Polkadot and Nier? So, um, there aren't any that currently exist. I guess maybe we're talking figurative bridge building at this moment in time. Um, so maybe share a little bit more about kind of like what that interoperability looks like um, from the Octopus perspective. Sure. I mean, yeah. we've talked to Axelar and Composable and a bunch of other organizations who have like similar missions. And we think what they're doing is incredibly important. The way that Axelar does this is also important. The proposal from uh, Composable that's on Near Governance Forum, I was so glad to see Ilya's response from that because that's taking on the encryption types that we need to make it easier to communicate between the two environments, right? But the, um, the, the side of it that is basically us paying homage to Polkadot is that the substrate chains that we help launch, they are specifically positioned to be able to move on to Polkadot. It's not that they actually bridge there. It's that they are their own independent entities. We're not asking them to be the glue between Near and Polkadot. We're asking them to enjoy the benefits of Near, and if they can grow up as substrate chains, mature to the level that Polkadot needs. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to be a mature entity before you go for that parachain auction slot. So then in some way, like, do you consider it almost like a breeding ground? I don't want to. I don't want to put words in your mouth in that way, but that's how you like. You're, it feels like you're describing. We it. call it the bottom of the substrate market. The top of the substrate bottom market is definitely Polkadot. The best products go there. We we understand that the most mature, complete, you know, feature suite things, they go to Polkadot, and that makes sense. But they need a place to start. In the mentality before Octopus Network, those chains had to start with really long test nets. The example I usually give is math. I love Math Wallet. What those guys are doing is great. They had to live on a production test net for more than a year. You shouldn't have to do that. That's basically our model to give them a chance to kind of start at an MVP and grow up. OK, cool. And then maybe you can talk a little bit from the Axlar perspective, any current oper interoperability or planned interoperability between Polkadot and Near. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think before we go into the specifics of how that actually works from an Axler perspective, I would just say from Axler's point of view, the future is going to be all completely interconnected, right? And you know, as a user, you won't really care whether this application is on Polkadot or on Octopus or anywhere else. You just have a direct relationship with the application. You'll have a very simple user experience. You click one or two buttons, and it just works, right? And how Axler is doing to enable that is we are a blockchain that connects to these other blockchain ecosystems in a many-to-many -many connectivity. So specifically with how we're connecting Polkadot to Near is right now we have a direct integration to Moonbeam on the Axler network. What that means is we're able to pass messages, call smart contracts from any of the other 23 chains we're connected to, which also includes Cosmo IBC chain, to Moonbeam. And then Moonbeam via XCM is able to c communicate to the other parachains. So today, how we're able to work with some of the bigger parachain like, like Engine is they first pass a message via XCM to Moonbeam, and then via Axler pass messages to other EVM and Cosmos chains. And that's part of Moonbeam's overall uh, cross-chain strategy as well. But you know, what's really exciting for us is now we're going to have an alternative for these Polkadot ecosystem projects to, to directly connect with Near, And that's because Centrifuge, a very prominent project in Polkadot, has offered to help push, the for push it forward in the ecosystem and build a pallet 
for, the, uh, for an axler pallet in the substrate system. So within the next few months, when this pallet is complete, any substrate-based chains will be able to uh, integrate this pallet and have a direct connectivity from the parachain right into Axler. And then you can think of Axler as this hub in the middle, right? Once you're able to pass messages to Axler, we can then pass that message to Aurora, and through Aurora's new two-way contract calls, directly move it to near. And I do think that sounds excellent. We've talked to the Axler team a number of times, and we do appreciate the design. The octopus model is to not exist in the middle. It doesn't mean that it's wrong that Axelar does that. Axelar does that in an incredibly fair and reasonable way. Our model is just that trustless bridges should be priority, which means we're asking people to focus more on direct connections without a third party. It doesn't mean that Axelar is a bad word being that third party. You guys are doing a great job. It just means that the, the model that we're pushing forward is for direct integration between two different environments. Of course, I would say, Sheldon, like, totally hear you. And, but, you know, you look at the bridging space today, right? We think the far bigger problem is that most bridges and interoperability solutions today are very centralized. They're almost like a centralized exchange experience yep. ran by multi-sigs versus Axler is the only one that's truly de fully decentralized. And we recently launched quadratic voting, which actually further decentralizes the network even more so that we actually spread out the voting power a little bit more fairly. Our DNA has always been about security, and we think the best way to achieve that is through decentralization. Can you talk a little bit more about message passing through Octopus's perspective? Sure. So at the moment, Near is the only execution environment that's adjacent. That IBC solution that we're developing, we've proven it out. It can work. It is not used in production yet. We haven't made it easy. The validation is not complete yet. Um, that means that in prod today, that is genuinely the way that those chains interact is by using near as the simultaneous environment. But IBC from Cosmos as the lightweight alternative to incorporating a third party, because even if you, you don't mind the, the trust involved, a third party needs to be paid. You know, there needs to be someone footing the bill, right? So when there isn't a, a third party to pay for that, those two smaller organizations or younger chains, they have a much lower threshold to figure out how they can interact. You know, when they have an interaction and they're looking at like a margin of cost from another piece of infrastructure, it makes sense that it would be harder to rise above that cost. When it's direct between chains, you're just paying gas on both sides. So two different approaches. Um, I'm curious to get a sense of the audience. Who here, um, like what, what's everyone's background? If, if you're a developer, raise your hand. If you're more of like a, a user, right, maybe not like on the building side, raise your hand. Okay, so about 50 50, um, which is kind of interesting, right? Because, like, right now, thinking about interoperability from either perspective, it's just a fucking pain in the ass. <laughs> There's like nothing worse than like the current infrastructure that we have. And I think, like, my, my perspective, and I think all of our perspectives on stage, is that like, it's not interoperability just between kind of like one ecosystem. It has to cross ecosystems. Um, and right now, like, we're having, um, you know, we've, we've all seen some exploits that have been notable um, in the past couple of months. So um, the Nomad exploit, um, which I think heavily affected the Polkadot ecosystem. Um, I think we're in a, a good, stable place there. but they're not without their you know, real risks. So I'd love the two of you to chat a little bit about your perspectives um, on that and how um, we can create better security around interoperability because you shouldn't have to risk your assets in order to be able to like, move things cross chain. So love your thoughts. Yeah, I mean, I can start. I couldn't agree more, Ashley. I think today, the state of bridging or interoperability is just not ideal, right? We have so far to go still. Yep. And I think about like security. At Axler, we really see security as two things, right? First, a more secure design in the first place, something that doesn't have to have, you know, be centralized or have these assumptions that you really have to like hold close for it to work out. And then the second thing is having all kinds of contingency or safety measures so that so when something does go wrong, you're able to at least cap the loss or have some kind of like action plan to like mitigate the damage. I think there is no design that's perfectly secure, so we always have to plan for the worst. And you know, at Axler, as I mentioned earlier, from a pure design perspective, right, our team has spent over the last two years building out a decentralized interoperability solution. We're one of the only ones that's a blockchain that are able to connect other blockchains. And the reason why we built it like that is because proof-of-stake blockchains have been around for a long time. 
their security assumptions are well documented. We know what, how, how it works and how it doesn't work. And that's why we think it's been battle tested. And at the same time, when we look at the safety measures Axe has put in place, we have something called rate limits that ma caps the amount of asset transfer within a time interval. So if Axler were to be exploited, you can add essentially a stop loss on the application level on what the maximum damage would be. And of course, that's not enough, right? Just losing a little bit of money is still losing money. So in conjunction to that, we set up an insurance fund that's 5% of our to total token supply. And given that we did our last round at a billion dollars, that's a a substantial amount of money set aside to cover that loss in case an emergency does happen. And we also do various other things like rotating validator keys so malicious actor can't be accumulating keys, uh, keys and attack the network. And it's like things like this that we really b b think about on a daily basis because security is just absolutely paramount here. Yeah, speaking of decentralized insurance protocols, if anyone's building something like that, <laughs> please let me know because, um, you know, we've seen that being a real need in, in the space. But Sheldon, yeah, maybe you can talk a little bit about that. Sure, my answer is much shorter. <laughs> and I basically expressed it already. It's that we don't want this liability. I think that approaching that liability with a sane angle of, hey, we need to you know, restrict these things, pr provide contingencies, it makes a lot of sense. And the way that Axelar does it has my respect, hands down. But the model that we want to introduce for smaller entities is just trustless. It is the idea that the only other person that you need to interact with is someone who you already trust because you've already made a business arrangement with them to enable your two products to communicate. So I think that the components that Axelar is focused on are the right thing. I didn't know about the insurance fund. That's awesome. I'll have to look into that a little bit. But the model that we're looking at isn't designed for you know, someone who's prepared to really manage that. At a higher level, at a, a higher stage of growth, sure, it doesn't make sense to maintain 30 light clients to communicate with all the other blockchains. But that's why IBC is our focus. And if that means taking on an IBC palette and an XCMP palette at the same time in the future, I think that's not out of the question. It's just a matter of refining that to the point where it makes sense. Absolutely. I mean, we love IBC at Axler, right? That, that's why we built our blockchain using Cosmos SDK. And what really is we're trying to solve for is how do we have a near IBC-like experience for the non-IBC chains as well? Yeah, and I thought it was really interesting when I saw it was Injective because that's also another party we've been talking to about bringing it into Prod from Aster. So I, I almost uh, asked us to like say something publicly because, hey, we talked to you guys. We knew you guys were working on this. We're working on a similar product that works in a different way. Right. You know, in the sense of user experience, this should not be different. But we're still in the era that we're kind of planning the way these things are going to work and, and sort of structuring how that should look for a user long term. They're Sh they shouldn't care. They shouldn't know, right? But on the flip side of that, there's that person who's developing a small product. I don't want to set a capital barrier for projects to be able to you know, use bridges in a productive manner. So I'm not saying that Axelar does that necessarily. But the, the necessary cost that comes from a third party is just part of the reason why we're, we're structuring in that more lightweight manner. Makes sense. Um, we've got two minutes left. So I wanted to talk a little bit about roadmaps, because right now, like there really isn't interoperability between Nier and Polkadot, and I'm chomping at the bit. When's it going to like happen? Um, so if you guys can share a little bit, um, obviously everything always is kind of like a amorphous date, but uh, a little bit more about your roadmaps for kind of rolling out IBC and then um, that functionality, and then with Axelar, like when we can expect to like actually be able to use this. So I'll keep it relatively short. Our IBC product is in its final steps of validation, and there's two pull requests left on the relayer. So we're launching that by end of the year. Um, I'll be obligated to give a couple of workshops on it to make sure it's sort of easy to use. Um, I've already got a couple of third-party validators pulling it up and trying it. So the IBC stuff is relatively short throw. We're going to be there soon. Um, NFT bridging, I'm doing a testnet demo tomorrow at the booth. So mint and burn is not the most exciting thing in the world, but making it trustworthy is worthwhile at a small scale. You know, transferring an ape across chains is not something that we're going to see for quite a while because people are obsessed with this one PFP project. But at the same time, there needs to be something that makes it possible for these smaller organizations to be able to do their own fractionalization, to be able to make NFTs, move them to near, or move NFTs from near to another chain and back. So Axelor is going to cover a much larger footprint in that regard when you all get there. But because of the way we're doing this sort of like small business oriented deployment, it's much easier for us to say, hey, this is lightweight. This makes sense. I'm, I'm really looking forward to that. I'm excited for uh, getting to do that in public on Testnet. Yeah, I think for us in the short term, we're going to use Aurora as a hub and gateway to near. 
where we're really excited about the two-way message passing that Aurora just announced earlier this afternoon. We've been like working closely with that team to make sure that happens. As some of you guys might know, we already secured partnership with uh, Spin, a derivative platform on Near, as well as uh, Ref from last week. So we're ready to start building, right? And the missing piece has always been, how do you do two-way message passing from Aurora to Near? So now that that's ready, we're able to start building these like true cross-chain applications where you're able to do these cross-chain swaps or cross-chain deposits with just one click. And I think in the future, as Axler has more resources and we, fit, we you know, complete our roadmap on integration of some of the other la layer ones, what we'll do is we can potentially integrate Near natively, or if the rumor is true and Near does have an IBC connection, we'll be able to integrate Near like any other Cosmos chain. For us to integrate a new EVM and IBC chain, it only takes around 10 minutes. So every week, we're continuously adding new IBC chains. So if Near were to become IBC compatible, I think that would be amazing, because then we'll be able to have a direct connection to, to Near, and we'll be able to do all kinds of cool stuff. Awesome. Well, hopefully next year, we'll be having a very different conversation about the realities of this. So sure. I appreciate you guys joining us. And if you want to chat with Axelar or Octopus, Octopus has a booth over yes. in the... Off to the side. That area. Do that way. And then they can find you at the Aurora area? Or where can yeah, they... Yeah, I'll be at the Aurora booth, but we also have a cross-chain event tomorrow with Axler and our, some of our partners like Tricelaris, Aurora, and Squid. So if definitely uh, ask me for more information. We'd love to have you guys. Thank you. Cool. Thanks, everyone. Awesome. Thanks, Thanks guys. Ashley. Hello. All right. So we have a couple of um, changes in terms of our uh, panelists today. Um, so we have um, you know, a very distinguished panel of folks here to talk to us about auditing. So we have Robert from Autosec. We have Yanis from Chain Security. We have Yev from Hacken. And we also have Michal from Halborn. Um, so welcome to our panelists today. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so you know, I feel like throughout the day and just in general, we've been talking a lot about vulnerabilities, hacks, breaches. It's kind of inevitable, right? That it's so kind of top of mind for a lot of people. And so I think one thing that is clear is that security is a really tough problem to solve. It's, it's an inevitability. It's something that's bound to happen in terms of you know, just having vulnerabilities. But how do you solve that just because if you don't catch something, the risk is potential, you know, like actual impact is so severe. And so, you know, obviously auditors really kind of help our projects as they think about these issues and figuring out, hey, how can I catch all of my vulnerabilities? And so um, I'm really excited to kind of dig into this with you all. And I guess to start it off, I'd love to start with Robert and kind of go down the row here. Um, what are the typical vulnerabilities that you all are seeing lately, and um, you know, obviously I'd like to hear if there's anything kind of specific to Near, or um, maybe just across the board, what are the big trends you're seeing? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think when we do audits, we kind of categorize our findings in, I'd say, two broad categories. One would be chain-specific vulnerabilities, which deal with the underlying nuances of the chain itself. And then there's also broader logic class vulnerabilities. For example, if you have a lending protocol, you might have some sort of collateralization issue, which would be applicable to any chain, regardless of where you build that lending protocol. On the other hand, near specifically, you might have issues with, for example, state management, because near's state tracking means that you need to pay rent explicitly for storage. But unfortunately, it's like the way that that happens is by sending near to the contract as opposed to um, having like I'd say a, a more sane model of like the person paying for the transaction, paying for it implicitly, right? So, the, so that creates an issue where you know if you don't properly track state, then you might have um, a potential discrepancy where someone might be able to get more state than they otherwise should. I'd say the second you know major class of vulnerability we see on Near would be anything to do with asynchronous execution, right? Near is very unique in its execution model. Whenever you do a cross-contract call, it creates a receipt, and then that gets sent to another shard. And it's like asynchronous in nature. Um, and I can think of at least one audit where you know, I'd say like 75% of the bugs we found were 
due to discrepancies in how they track state, especially across callbacks? So yes, Robert made an excellent division. We also think in these terms. So chain-specific vulnerabilities and vulnerabilities that are related to the business logic. So what is really important is to find issues that our clients have missed when they were specifying, for example, uh, the properties that their implementations uh, wanted to hold. So uh, this is really important. Another issue that we usually find uh, has to do with numerical uh, problems. For example, decimals are not handled uh, correctly. So from the 10 specific uh, vulnerabilities, I think Robert covered it really well. So it has to do with the storage um, staking that it's really important in near. And yeah, I think that's it. And also the, the asynchronous execution, which, to be honest, I was expecting it when I was starting with Near to see more issues related to the asynchronous execution, but yeah, for some reason, uh, yeah, people handled quite well. Yeah, from our experience as well, like business logic is a huge and it's like uh, chain agnostic, and definitely having near specific vulnerabilities, just general vulnerabilities, and business logic where the most interesting stuff is hidden. But yeah, just uh, general like missing ownership checks, uh, signer checks is something that we deal with. Yeah, I guess all our experience are pretty similar. And yeah, the most uh, things I find are related to the uh, contract's logic and if it's actually performing what it's supposed to be doing. Um, and regarding uh, near specific things, it's uh, yeah, probably promises and the fact that cross-contract calls are asynchronous, which is different uh, and unique uh, across the whole chains. And I just wanted to add that it's really important, and this is something that we find o quite often, is uh, how the failure of these promises is handled. Oh, yeah. This is an issue that usually comes up when it comes to promises. Awesome. Thank you for that. Um, I guess as we kind of talk about, you know, near specific, um, obviously, uh, I would love to know, from your perspective, do you feel like there are some, is there are certain smart contract languages that are more secure than others? Th that's a tricky question. <laughs> <laughs> I, I personally like to uh, think of s uh, programming languages as just the tools. It's not like one's better and one's worse. Like all of them are Turing complete, so you pretty much can code anything in it. And so you can have the most secure language and still have vulnerabilities in there. But if I had to choose, I guess that would be Rust, because out of the box, uh, it's the most, it, it has the, the, uh, the most security features just ready, uh, ready out of the box. But it's not like because you're using Rust, then you're suddenly secure. Uh, I can add to this. So I guess there are more mature languages and less mature languages. And there are also languages that require more verbosity, and maybe they expose uh, the semantics better. For example, uh, Rust is more verbose, but I guess it doesn't hide you know, how the pointers are handled uh, compared to Solid, for example, which we usually find that you know, audit, uh, sorry, programmers uh, ignore some of the features of the language, maybe because also the developers are not as mature because you know, the language is not uh, so well tested or it, not, you know, it hasn't been for so long? I guess kind of, you know, uh, on that, I mean, obviously we're, you know, utilizing JavaScript now um, we, with the JavaScript SDK. That's been around a little bit longer. <laughs> and, um, you know, in terms of if you're referring to, you know, someone who's a bit or a language that's more established, um, I mean, what are your thoughts on kind of, you know, opening this whole new door with the JavaScript SDK? Anyone? OK, I mean, I can comment. I guess I'll talk a bit about the previous question, too, because um, I had some thoughts there. I think one thing that we, we think a lot about as auditors is how do we make languages structurally safer? Right? I think while it's true, um, as we mentioned before, that you, know, you can write bugs in any language, I think one thing that we care strongly about is how do you make a language in a way such that the default path or the easy path is the safe one. Because I think if you do it that way, if it's like the easiest solution is the safe one, then people are going to write safer contracts. Right? And that's something that we care really strongly about. We've published, or I, I've written like a number of blog posts you know, about this general topic. Um, and I guess I'd also add that there's kind of this distinction between Rust 
broadly, and I'd say also like Rust per chain, right? So for example, when you're talking about using Rust in Near, I'd say it's like Rust plus whatever the Near bind gen SDK is, right? Near has many specific parts of it which make the Rust when you're writing like Near contracts. Um, like specific to near, as opposed to say Solana, right? Like Solana has extended DSL in the form of Anchor, which is like a whole different language compared to when you're writing near contracts. Um, I guess going back to the like JavaScript SDK, I mean, I personally am not a huge fan of that, just because, I mean, I, I think Rust is a really good language, and I like, I, I think Rust is probably better. Like it has type safety. It's you know a prettier language in general. It it, it like enables many of these features that you, like there's a reason why people use Rust, you know, when they're writing memory critical or like safety critical systems. Um, but yeah, I, I'm curious what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, I guess at the end of the day, it's important that you can focus on business logic and building products rather than doing other stuff which is connected to language or others. It's good to have proper documentation, proper tools, and clear understanding how it works and security from the box, which is not every time possible. But it's good to have and focus on building rather than thinking about all other problems that language may cause. Awesome, thank you. And you know, uh, to your point, I, I do see your uh, perspective of, yeah, Rust is very solid when it comes to security. And I'm hoping that, you know, with this whole like kind of bringing in all of the JavaScript developers, like we'll be able to maybe bring in more like knowledge and just people who have more experience and have that perspective, right? Um, instead of just maybe people who've been complacent with security all along. Um, I guess, you know, obviously something that, you know, if there are builders in the audience or, you know, something that is very top of mind is it's extremely difficult to get an audit right now. Um, it is very costly. There's huge long waits. And obviously as the ecosystems keep growing and projects, the number of projects grows exponentially, like, um, I would love to kind of ask about how you guys are thinking about scaling your practices. And you know, obviously, as we're <laughs> really entering this um, idea of like audits being a bottleneck, like what do you hope to achieve to kind of solve that problem? So scaling, at least the way we perceive this concept, is quite tricky to get it right, especially when it comes to audits, because with we don't want to compromise uh, the quality of our work. So scaling and hiring many engineers who are not, um, who are not ready to, to take the responsibility, they don't, they're not knowledgeable enough to audit code, uh, you know, might uh, have results that we don't want. So scaling, unfortunately, is something that we have to live with, at least for now, or you know, until we find a better way to perform audits more precisely. I guess it's more about complex work starting from standards, methodologies, what we have now in like Solidity and EVM based chains mostly, and uh, having the clear standard what audit is, what should be checked, and for everyone to do kind of basic checks. Because for now, audit is something that's like perceived in different uh, ways for uh, different auditors, and we don't have clear standards what should be covered. Also, it's about knowledge sharing. As far as we don't have this, everyone uh, does what they want and what they think is proper. I guess that's the foundation we should create, like standards, like tools, methodologies uh, that's, that's already working in Web2 and uh, starting in EVM stuff. So I guess like knowledge sharing and doing this first, it will help to scale. But for sure, getting audit now, especially for like Near and other Rust chains, is not that easy as getting that for EVM-based chains. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's no way around it. Audits take time. They need to take time. We need to understand the, the, the project. We need to know what it's supposed to be doing. And then we need to verify everything that, that, that the client wants us to want us to agree. So the only natural way to scale is to have more of us. And there Do you is think it's no possible? Yeah, I, well, <laughs> I, I wish. But uh, as we can see, we are, we're, we're still um, uh, have, have, have a lot of uh, new places to, to, to uh, to, to, to hire and um, uh, and don't know. I I honestly think that uh, we should be focusing on hiring new people, like to maybe accepting like knowledge sharing to to because uh, th there's a, there is a lot of um, security experts in Web2 and the only thing um, preventing them from joining us here at Web3 is that they 
don't know yet about blockchain, how it works. Uh, I guess we should change that uh, in the first place and then work from that. I yeah. guess shortage of talents in Web2 is still like huge, especially in security. <laughs> We're not talking about uh, like Web3 security. Just think how many projects uh, on the market now and how many auditors. Yeah, I'd actually disagree a little bit. I think that there are things that products can do to make their, you know, to make it easier to get audited, right? I mean, for for us at least as an auditor, it's much easier to read code, to understand code that is well documented, you know, follows good practices has you know sane variable names you know if if you put in the time as a project to actually care about security and to write your code in a way that is easy for someone else to understand then i think it's going to be easier for us to perform an audit it'll be faster it'll be cheaper and it'll overall be better for you um, so I, I mean i think you know at least for us we prefer to work with projects that actually do care about security and i think that is definitely something that you can do to you know make the process a little bit less painful Right, and there is also the thing that we discuss, uh, which is the audit readiness. So you got a slot to be audited, but is your project ready to be audited? I don't know what the take of the others here about projects that you know are ready to be audited from your company, but they are not ready because they haven't, for example, specified all the properties that their implementation wants to follow. Yeah, I guess for us it's important that projects come for like really auditing work, or like work, rather than just comparing documentation on what they have in real code. And it's not only about audits because a lot of projects just do this at the end of the year, like before releasing, not from the scratch when they are planning the architecture and doing all this security stuff before, not after they done everything and they like, okay, security just like a quick fix and uh, let's go. Unfortunately, that's the perception on the market for major part, but still it's getting better. If comparing to five years ago, where the security was like nice feature to have rather than the necessity, and I like that now like more regulators, let's say like crypto regulators, requiring that like venture funds, exchanges, platforms, it's getting more more um, demanded, but still. Awesome. So I guess you know that's a really good segue into my next question, which is I wanted to ask you know for the builders who are you know interested in maybe like getting an audit or even just building a project, right? At what point should they start thinking about the audit process? Um, I mean, I guess to your point, like they should just start thinking about it from day zero, um, and you know to Robert's point as well, like build your code in a way that is easily auditable. But um, I mean, you know, like in earnest, once again, it takes a lot of capital to kind of pay for it, and it does take a while. So um, you know, from your perspective, like at what point should projects start thinking about, seriously thinking about getting an audit? With the first line of code. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I guess say, before, before, like yeah, even before, like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, say security is not something you can say that it's done for your project. It's basically a continuous process. So, if you want an audit, that, that's cool, that's great. You should be audited. But if you start thinking about security from the very beginning, and then you can maybe uh, go to go through this iteratively. So maybe you you'll be audited more than once, which is also a good idea. Um, and that way you will be able to build with security in mind, uh, which is always the better approach. Right. They should, developers should make it easy, as Robert said, for the auditors you know, to do as well as they can. That's really important. Yeah, I feel like starting as early as possible is always good, right? I mean, at, at the very least, you can shop around, you can talk to multiple audit firms, and then you can get competitive quotes for your for your project, right? So at the very least, you know, if you, if you start earlier, right, instead of right before the deadline, there, I think there's a pretty big monetary incentive that you know, you'll have a cheaper audit. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think you know, we're all audit shops. We're going to tell you to start as early as possible and to reach out to us as soon as you can. <laughs> so yeah. Cool. All right, awesome. And I guess you know, kind of what you guys were saying before, there aren't a lot of you in the space right now, right? And so maybe to people out there who are maybe considering getting into auditing, um, you know, obviously I think like bug bounties have been something that have been around for a while and like uh, maybe there are a lot of people who just kind of enjoy doing that, but if they wanted to get into like auditing like smart contracts, like what is kind of like the profile of an auditor and what do you guys look for and you know, what's kind of like the difference maybe between someone who just does bug bounties versus like auditing? Uh, learn quickly. If you're able to learn quickly, you'll, you'll do fine. 
Like it's the most important thing. Uh, I, I believe so. Yeah. You also have to be passionate. Yeah, curiosity learn, right? is the must. Yes, and of course you have to have an eye, an eye for detail, right? Because unfortunately, you know, devils hide in the details. So yeah. <laughs> But uh, other than that, I think, you know, being able to learn as quickly as possible because the, uh, the whole ecosystem develops really quickly is what uh, it's a must have. Yeah, I think we, we try to hire from people who perform very well in traditional security. So, I mean, we hire pretty exclusively from people who have already have a strong track, rec track record of, you know, hacking Web2 targets. And our, our theory is that if you're really good at hacking websites, you're probably also going to be very good at hacking, uh, you know, smart contracts, which are essentially just serverless apps running on some blockchain in like some other language, right? Like fundamentally, these concepts cross apply very, very well. Yeah, I would say that uh, through our experience of building bug bounty platform for the last five years and having more than 12K hackers for like crypto projects, that's like different profiles because there's people who think fast, learn fast, they are curious, and they're kind of independent. So auditors and the auditing work and hackers work is different because auditors go through all the scope of work, checking everything, and hackers just go where they want, what they like curious about, and they can like definitely go to one vulnerability for like weeks uh, or months for auditors who don't have that time. We have like limited engagements. Uh, and doing our best to ensure the full scope is covered and like super important stuff are covered. But still, it's not the same. Right. We are more holistic in a sense. Uh, and also, it's important that, you know, the hacker needs to find a bug, but the auditors need to make sure that there's no, there are no more bugs to be found. So it's a completely different thing. All right. And I guess if you guys are, I, if people are, Seriously, thinking about it, are you all hiring? <laughs> of course. <Sure>. Yeah, <laughs> always. <laughs> all right, so you heard it here, folks. If you are interested in getting into auditing, they're all hiring. Um, all right, cool. And so I guess we're you know, kind of down to our last few minutes. I'd love to kind of figure out, like, what are you guys really excited about? Like, what do you think is next? And what really motivates you? Okay, <laughs> I guess uh, building this industry kind of from the scratch and implementing ideas and approaches you learned from Web2, how that would work in Web3, that's interesting. If we're talking about security, definitely now it's the question about tools, methodologies, and standards all of us creating. For example, for EVMs, they have like Ethereum Enterprise Alliance who making the standards. I guess we should have something like this for the ecosystem that are growing right now. Uh, to have kind of auditors that specializing on this and have clear, clear standards. I guess that's, that's important for, uh, for the ground. Right, so another thing is, you know, uh, we are passionate about learning, uh, as we said. So the question is, what we wake up and we wonder, what are we going to learn uh, today? And also another question is, how are we going to improve our processes or maybe our tools to, you know, to contribute to this space and make it a little bit safer? So this is really important. But also, it's just a challenge. Like, I've never had that many Eureka moments before, before doing Web3. It's like solving a really hard mathematical problem. And you just suddenly wake up, and you have an idea. And then you just, just try it out, and it might work. And that's, that's the best feeling. Yeah, I think there's a lot of cool innovation to be done with regard to making programs like structurally safer. I know, I know we talked a bit about the scaling issue. And I feel like you know, there's a lot of innovation still about how can we, for example, automate some of that process with tooling. You know, how can we, for example, formally verify contracts to prove that they're secure? How can we you know, have these processes in place such that you, we don't need as much human intervention? Of course, I think there's always going to be a human element. But ideally, we want to minimize that as much as possible so we can scale out better. Um, and I know, at least personally for me, I think that's kind of where the, the bleeding edge of security research is going to be. And that's something that you know, we're very actively looking into and is really exciting. Awesome. Thank you all so much. I guess, um, you know, if, do any of you have like, any last thoughts that you'd like to share with the audience? I guess that security is really important. Yes. <laughs> and we have to build uh, with security in mind from day zero. We develop for security. Yes, I think my big takeaway is like even before 
you even think about your project to just have a security mindset. It scares a bit <laughs> just to think that before. But uh, I guess what is important to have security more preventive rather than reactive. And also it's important to notice that security is a process, ongoing process, and it starts from the day zero and it continues all the time. And it's good to have not just auditors at the end, it's good to have structured defense depths uh, process in your project when you do uh, internal audits, external audits, bug bounties, like insurance, and you do everything possible uh, to, protect, uh, to protect your users, your reputation, and the finance. Amazing. Yeah. All right, well, thank you to our panelists. Um, obviously, let's give them a round of applause. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I was mentioning to them earlier, you know, security is something that I personally am really passionate about, but, you know, being in a room full of, like, auditors, I feel like, um, you know, they have amazing insights. And so at the end of the talk, if you guys are interested or have any questions, please feel free to, you know, come up and talk to them. But, yeah, thank you again for sharing your thoughts and time today. It's been a pleasure. Thank All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, hello guys, uh, I'm Luca, uh, and today I'm going to talk about Treasury, which is a very important topic for crypto projects, especially, I would say, especially in a bear market situation like we're facing right now. Um, before, I get, uh, before I go into details about this topic, um, a few words about Avantgarde and, and Enzyme. Enzyme is the uh, um, operating system for DeFi asset management, totally permissionless protocol, launched in 2019. Uh, deployed in Ethereum Polygon, uh, as, as, you may, uh, um, and as you may figure, also looking at uh, near the inner near ecosys ecosystem strategically. And uh, Avantgarde is, uh, we are the core developers uh, of the Enzyme protocol. And, uh, you know, we take care of the roadmap and uh, looking at further uh, possible uh, uh, developments of the protocol. Um, first thing, treasuries are bleeding especially in the situation of the market. Uh, it's not uncommon to see this type of wallets that have been going down like more than 95%. It's actually, uh, on average, uh, treasury wallets have gone down 90%, mostly because of the uh, total lack of the, uh, diversification, highly concentrated in one single token. And uh, especially for DAOs, there is obviously more like uh, there's chaotic governance processes which make it make it really hard to make decisions around how to manage mon money. We will talk about uh, that in a second. And there's actually something also a bit maybe like underrated, which is what we call uh, halo effect. Uh, it's a typical cognitive bias uh, whereby founders, which are you know who are typically uh, technically minded or coming from a technical background their skill does not necessarily translate into financial uh, skill set, uh, but they're still, uh, you know, they're still re responsible for managing those treasuries. Uh, so it's important to manage those treasuries more and more professionally. Uh, the consequences of not managing uh, treasuries in the right way can be really dire, especially in a market like this. The runways are getting shorter and shorter. The burn rate are not really going down so much. And so projects find themselves unable sometimes to fund uh, key initiatives that actually can uh, ev uh, make the, pro the project evolve in, in, uh, in the future. And so you also see like, things like forced sell-offs where you have to actually sell tokens at the worst possible time in the market in order to, find op to fund operations. And I think there's also a human factor in all this. When the resources get scarcer and you have conflicting priorities, then you see also possibly frictions within the core team, which might, might lead to like total collapse of the, of the project, which is obviously something to avoid at all costs. So I think this is like the lesson learned and something that all project, crypto projects have to take on as a, uh, as a mantra. Professionally, treasury management is an integral part of any project long-term success. This is like something that uh, has to be internalized by all project. And we get it, I mean, let's, let's exercise some empathy. 
Some, sometimes treasury management is not really uh, professionalized, not, not so well done because it's overwhelming. There's so many questions to answer before something can get implemented. Those questions, is like, those questions are typically um, how, can, uh, how can we keep uh, custody, how can we maintain control, decentralized control and security around those, those assets? How can we get an effective, quick, uh, fast delegation without uh, trusting uh, somebody with our funds? And then like, after you answer those two questions, you still have like, what strategy are we actually going to run? And who is going to be in charge of managing those funds? And I think I would like to make a point here because like, most of the times founders tend to think in, two, in these two buckets. And uh, I spend a lot of time in uh, governance fora, and it's obvious that it, the, the conversation always goes into this uh, pros and cons and opposite direction. One is like, okay, we either keep our funds safe in a, and we control them through a multi-signature wallet, uh, which is, you know, and we have to live with a very slow, very tedious uh, approval process because every time we run a transaction, we, have, we need ten, ten signatures. So obviously we cannot have like fast implementation. And on, on the other side of the spectrum, we have something like, okay, let's delegate it to somebody else who can manage, who can like professionally do it, but then we have to give them some sort of direct access to our funds. And of course, neither of them, let me tell you, spoiler alert, neither of them actually works. Because as we said, on, in the first one, approval fatigue, too many things, too many signatures, too many, uh, you know, too many uh, steps. And so there's a paralysis right there. Same thing happens on the other side, same paralysis, but for different reasons. Because every time you bring up the idea of trusting somebody, with direct, some direct access to your funds, then obviously there's a whole bunch of community pushback and, uh, and paralysis right there because then things get simply stuck. So, big questions of today, big question is where do we go from here? Well, then that's, well, that's all I came for uh, to Lisbon to actually answer this very specific question. The answer is Enzyme, which is the, uh, it's a crucial piece of infrastructure and tooling for treasury management. And we are very excited about this because not only is it a sound technical solution, but it's also the extra benefit of, of using something like Enzyme is avoiding the, the endless arguments about, hey, shall we trust somebody? Shall we not? Shall we keep security? How do we delegate? And so forth. Let me tell you exactly how it works so you understand why you think you can get both. Let's say, let's say you start with a treasury multisig, like Agnosis, say, for example, but it could be other. Uh, you know, it could also come from a, like a custodian if you're like a more centralized project. Let's say, but let's say you start with a multisig. What you can do with your multisig, which is the, where, where you have initially your funds, you can create and own your vault, you, meaning you create a specific contract on Enzyme that you own and control. And there, you can actually, in your vault, in your enzyme vault, you can then deposit funds. And when you do deposit funds, you receive uh, shares, which are tokenized shares, like uh, EOC20 tokens, which can be held and custodied in the uh, smart, co smart contract uh, wallet. That also means that at any point in time, you can go back to the, to the vault, burn those shares, and redeem those funds. So you effectively have control non-custodial control uh, over your asset. And here it's where it gets even more interesting because the step two is actu actually now you can delegate to somebody else who's like more like professionally prepared and specialized in running that strategy, operating that strategy. As you, as you can see from this like darker box, you effectively create like a safe playground where you can delegate to somebody else according to certain rules. Because as you can see here, you can encode in a smart contract, smart contract exactly what the manager can do. You can say, hey, you can only touch these two assets. You can only interact with these two protocol. You can only take as, you know, like this much slippage for every trade you do. So you have a level of granularity of, the, of those permissions, which is super accurate. And you can define those rules and enforce them as smart contracts. So it's not really based on trust. It's based on code, which is the most important thing. And this manager then 
can be actually a professional manager. Uh, you know, it can be also an internal delegation, an internal, uh, internally, uh, internal person that is appointed to manage those assets. But the good thing is that you can enable then speed and efficiency because you have one single uh, operator that can do, can do uh, several, several things as long as they are pre-approved, right? That guy or that person can actually uh, deploy a strategy which is pre-agreed by the whole DAO or by the whole project multisig and also update it. And here, again, I would like to make another point. It's not just about defining a strategy. It's also about keeping it up to date. Because most of the time, strategies like they go obsolete very soon. So it's important to keep uh, on top of the markets and see how things evolve and what needs to be done. And to close the loop, last point, you get the transparency of a 24-7 track record, which shows exactly the evolution of your or your whole strategy of multiple, uh, uh, sorry, of your treasury with multiple uh, strategies in, in, in all in one. So all unified under the same vault and under the same interface. You get a track record and you get a transaction log. So everybody can go and see the full log of all single transactions that have been executed on your treasury. So we have, I guess I made the point that we have two of those important questions down. So the how is there, but then so like what strategy can we run and who can run it? Uh, in terms of what, what we, we can run, uh, we definitely have, you know, like you can define your own bespoke, uh, very custom made uh, DeFi strategies. We have 15 integrations on, on, on Ethereum and around five on Polygon. So you can really define your own strategy based on your own needs. And uh, some, one of the cool things, for example, you could automate uh, a DCA strategy into stablecoin. Let's say you want to diversify, you can have like an automation that runs a dollar cost averaging and gets more into stable. So you can have, you, ha you don't have to argue about, is it a good time to buy? Is it a good time to sell? That again leads to paralysis and endless discussions. You can also do other things like, uh, uh, you know, yields and DAO to DAO swaps are also possible. You can participate in governance from an enzyme vault. There's a bunch of things that you can do. And if you see something that you cannot do yet, well, just be aware that Avantgarde is there really to help and, uh, and do custom uh, developments for, also for, 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 for users. Um, and like I was talking, and uh, Avantgarde can actually help also in terms of management. I mean, we, we have expertise in DeFi and traditional finance. And we do custom development, as I said before, if something is not there yet, but a user would like to see it. And we can define uh, strategies, help project define their own strategies, tailor it to their needs, and then execute them and keep them up to date all the time. Like this one, for example, on the left, you see like a strategy that has just uh, started a few weeks ago with Nexus Mutual, which has deposited, deposited around 15,000 Ethereum and is now running a strategy with uh, Maple Finance based on, uh, on an enzyme vault. So this is an example of something that can be done. So I guess now we cover all the bases and I, we understand that it's overwhelming and it's, uh, and it's uh, complex. And there's a lot of decisions, a lot of people that have to make decisions around these topics, but we are there to help and we definitely have the critical piece of infrastructure that can enable this, uh, uh, this professional management. And I guess the icing on the cake uh, is the fact that you can have a totally wide label uh, vault on Enzyme. That means that you can have a custom interface that has the looks and feel of your project with your logos and, uh, and colors and themes. You can have a unique URL, so that's good. Uh, you can link it on your, onto your website. It's fully com it's community oriented. So it's really like where the community comes together to see the status of your finances. And so Enzyme can actually become like a purely invisible DeFi layer that, you know, that user, they don't even need to know necessarily that Enzyme is in the background. Question is like, how near is near? I think we are uh, looking at the near ecosystem. We are excited to see that all the DeFi uh, projects coming up and the DeFi ecosystem that is evolving. Uh, we have a strategic, obviously, interest in, in how it's evolving. And we are exploring. Uh, uh, we are exploring like the possible deployments onto, uh, onto Nier. Definitely, so we want to 
hear from the projects, hear from you guys, uh, hear your needs. And definitely we're interested in, uh, in talking to projects that might want to run a professional treasury management on near natively or also elsewhere on Ethereum or, po or Polygon. But obviously near being like probably the main, uh, uh, the main place for, for them. Um, I'm a very pragmatic guy, so this is uh, uh, this QR code leads to my to my calendar. So if somebody wants to have a chat with me uh, these days, happy to sit down with you guys and have a, a 30 minutes so we can go into details of how or what we can work together. Here you can also see my uh, Telegram uh, handle. So if you uh, if you want to have a more direct contact, you can also text me here. And uh, I don't know if there's a round of question, otherwise. My presentation is concludes here. Thank you very much. All right, hello everyone. Thank you guys so much for rolling in today. This is a a, a very hot topic in our worlds because we're both in music, um, and this is very. We're seeing this solve a lot of problems in the future of the music business and even morphing into new things we never thought of, <laughs> such as Endless. Um, but I'm Amber Stoneman with Minting Music. This is Tim from Endless FM. And we're just going to kind of talk about um, how musicians are using Web3 right now and the tools um, Endless is building to support these musicians. Um, a lot of First off, we kind of need to give a little background on Tim. I think it actually solidifies, you know, why you've built what you've built and where you came from. So take us through a little bit of an intro on yourself and kind of, you know, what's your background and how you got into music and tech. Yeah, so my musical journey started um, when I was a kid, five years old. Um, I picked up the violin. And what I loved about the violin is it, it's embodied. Um, you put your bow on the string, you move your body, music happens while you're mo moving your body, and when you stop moving your body, the music stops. So it's something um, that's essentially communicative. It happens in a space, it can happen in a space with people, and it can inspire interactions. So that was my frame, that set the frame for what music was for me. And then when I was a teenager, I fell in love with electronic music, and um, I knew that that sound world was gonna be my life's work. Um, but at the time, electronic music was the absolute opposite of embodied music. You know, you'd go into the studio, you'd design music on a screen, um, you'd spend weeks, months producing, editing, um, and then you'd wait months for it to be pressed on a record and then released. Um, so I kind of struggled with that world for, um, for a long time because I knew it was, it, it was, I loved the sounds, but I didn't like the methods. So I struggled, I struggled with the old methods, but after a while I started to build my own tech, um, which would allow me to be spontaneous, to, to play electronic music um, in a sort of conversational, spontaneous way. Uh, and that basically uh, culminated in me kind of abandoning my record career. I had a three album deal with my dream record la label. I did one album um, and then you know, did like 150 shows in that year, touring the album. Um, and at the back end of that year, I actually released one of the um, bits of software that I'd been working on as a product. Um, and well, apart from anything else, it made more money than the entire record and all the touring of that year. And it was so effortless to do that I felt like, yeah, this is, this is where it's at for me. And most importantly, um, I was making instruments that allowed me to relate to music in the way I wanted to relate to music. So that's really the backstory to Endless. The way Endless works, the way you make music on Endless, is lifted directly out of that instrument I built for myself. Um, and that came after this kind of realization that um, ultimately the technology I'd built was much better, the potential of it was much bigger than just me as an artist. It was something that could and should be brought to the world. And that's what Endless yeah. is about, specifically. And and you being an artist unlocked a lot of problems in the industry or problems that you were having or thing, resources you didn't have access to. And you're like, okay, well, I'm just going to build it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then ultimately, it being a tool that other artists get to lean into that resource as well. So I, I think that that's an important, important topic to talk about, like as far as your intro, um, your background and how it led into Endless because... 
Endless, I mean, take us through like the mission of, of this type of technology specific to music and gaming. Yeah, well, I mean, the mission really um, evolved out of what music was for me as a kid. And, um, and then growing up and then in the music industry, um, for me, the mission was always to turn music, to transform music into something we do rather than just a product that we consume alone. And like, that's something that's important to me as a mission. Um, understanding the technology we've built at Endless and the experiences we're building around Endless and how those relate to where we are now in the cycle of the music industry, the media industry, Web3, AI, gaming. Um, this is basically, what was it? it was about 10 years ago that people started saying that you know, software is eating the world. There was this whole narrative coming out of Silicon Valley, software is eating the world. Um, I think we're now at an inflection point where that, um, you know, that's, that has happened. Software has eaten the world. The next thing that will eat the world is gaming. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of talk, obviously there's a lot of talk about Web3, there's a lot of talk about AI. Um, these are two very important components in this revolution, the gaming revolution, but ultimately it's game mechanics um, that will leverage Web3 and leverage AI to deliver experiences that where we're moving away from production and production by an elite group of producers and consumption by, through mass distribution to much more peer-to-peer, community-driven experiences. And that's essentially gaming. You know, you look at the, the companies that have been in incredibly successful in the last five years or so, they're all gaming adjacent. Twitch, Roblox, Fortnite, Minecraft. And also, I would say, you know, the NFT boom of 2021 was also very gaming, the, the way it played out was very gaming-like. You know, all the analogies of, you know, getting these Discord servers and, you know, trying to get on the pre-mint and all of this yeah, stuff. Yeah, the it's utility of those NFTs and music. Exactly, yeah. And, and the, the narrative about that was very much driven by gaming. So, you know, to translate this thing that I, I feel in my heart about what music is for me um, into how, how we then frame that into a mission that speaks to where the world is at today, we're gamifying the music industry. Mm -hmm. that's, the, that's the simplest way to talk about what we're doing. I, one of the things I love most about what Endless is doing is it's bringing community and relationships together. Well, it's bringing community and it's building relationships with this community. And it's, it's giving, I mean, we all know after COVID, um, being in music city capital of the world in Nashville, Everyone went to Zoom to collaborate. Well, there's a lot of problems with Zoom on collaborating in real time on an asset like music. And so what we were seeing is like there's delay there. It was hard to collaborate in that space. And now Endless has created something where you can collaborate in real time with a ton of different elements that you would need for a song. You can mint it yeah. in real time. And you know, and you get you get split royalties as well. Um, so those things talk more about the community aspect, the relationships, and how that collaboration happens on Endless. Yeah. Well, again, coming back to the gaming analogy, what what gaming is really good at is basically minimizing time to impact. Um, in a multiplayer game, a real time game, um, you carry out some action. You'll get feedback from your fellow players um, pretty much immediately. Um, look at the music industry as it is today. Time to impact is measured in days at best, probably more like weeks and, and months till you get that feedback loop. Um, so we, you know, really, we're, we're, we're optimizing everything for time to impact. So um, yes, we've, you know, we've engineered around the latency problem um, because we use, basically, we're, this is a whole other deep dive in like how we did it for, on, a, on a technical level. But we allow you to um, collaborate in real time, to, to have a real time experience that you feel like you're in the same room as people you're collaborating with, but you don't suffer from the Zoom latency problem. Um, and what's really, so on, on Endless, you know, you and I can jump into a jam. Now we could be trading beats, vocals, synth lines, whatever, and build up music on the fly. And then we could share a link to that jam out and. Anybody, you know, to our audiences, anybody can tune in in real time on the web um, and 
can pick up that music as NFTs as it's being made. So again, like time to impact, time to value, time between you, us creating something and us having royalties split back into our near wallets can be measured in seconds. What's really powerful that, with that is that it makes our interactions a conversation. We move out of the zone where we're kind of like trying to figure out how we're going to co-produce this asset and then put together a marketing plan, uh, which we will then execute in a month or so's time. Um, we reduce that whole time frame to like a minute or two, and we turn it into a conversation. So the creative process is a conversation. The collection process is a conversation. Everything is an interaction. And it means that there's this instant feedback loop. Um, so we're going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth in creation, in transaction, in following. Um, and that's what builds relationships. Like all the people who you know and love in your lives, um, you've come to know and love those people by being in the same room together and you know, through banter and quick interactions where you, you really learn, you learn the essence of those people. And that's like, we're empowering that for music uh, and that's what gaming is good at. Yeah. And, and when it comes to Web3 um, and transactions, you know, having, you make an NFT, I pick up your NFT a minute later, um, and then a few seconds after that, you have the royalties in your wallet. So you can then go and pick up your NFT. Um, and then their NFT. So it becomes a vector for building relationships and community. And to slight, this is a whole other conversation, but to slightly skim on what you said around royalties, it, this is a huge pain point in the music business. Um, the bus there's an artist side to music, and then there's a business side to music, and there's a bunch of suit and ties that are buying and selling catalogs all the time. And so the latency in getting a payment for PROs, for performance rights organizations, is nine months. Nine months at minimum. And so you're paying out in seconds, <laughs> and the real world music industry is paying out nine to 10 months later, if you're lucky. <laughs> so this also hits on the royalty problem as well, and getting creators money in their pockets to be able to turn right around and create more. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's crazy what the musicians and the music industry kind of have to put up with. I mean, it, it's kind of a miracle we have a music industry at all. It is a miracle. Uh, I think it's just, uh, I mean, it's more a testament to the power of music. And yeah. when people get inspired by music, inspired to create, inspired to participate in the music industry, um, like, there will, there will be no barriers to creation because, like, the music industry has put up so many. It's like, you know, if you, you get, you know, you're a developer, you get a job with um, a tech company, um, you get your salary at the end of every month. Like, musicians get their salary, and, and, and that's nine months before that you even start thinking about getting paid. A lot, you know, I've, when, um, when I was making music, I did a few, um, a few tracks in like production libraries for like BMG and Sony production libraries. Um, the peak of those royalties started coming in about four years later. And it's, it's just, it's just, yeah, it's crazy. So. It is so crazy. A, a song, say we play Lady Gaga song right now, that one song reaps 10 royalty streams in that moment. 10 different royalty streams and they all have different owners. So a song is a mega fractionalized asset mm. that is paying the upward on a major label artist, 30 creatives in one stream. So the accountability, the admin work, just all of it is so like jumbled in the Web2 space mm. that it's creating epic opportunity uh, to be able to claim and collect all in real time and to yeah. be able to use that m money and turn right around and invest more into your art. Totally. And also, I think there's a, there's a side note there as well that um, I remember when, so when, you know, when Ethereum launched in 2015, I had a lot of friends like Imogen Heap, for example, a very good friend of mine, Love big them. technologist. She, she basically kind of released the first music on the blockchain like way back when. Um, and I was kind of, I was, I was bearish on blockchain back then um, because all the narratives I was hearing about the application for blockchain in music was solving 
rights distribution. And I was just like, nah, because the problem is not a technology problem. The problem is a vested interest problem. So because there's a technology that can distribute royalties program programmatically and instantly, doesn't mean that PRO X is going to give up their 4% cut for being a middleman because there's better technology. It's not going to happen. Yeah. And it still isn't going to happen. So I think what, you know, the real opportunity for, um, for Web3 Music is to just build around, you know, not to try and solve these, solve these problems. Um, and I think that's, that's where you know, this kind of new cohort of Web3 Music companies, um, are, what all these projects are doing. This is where all these projects are getting really interesting, I think, because we're, we're building around the music industry rather than trying to go in and solve, yeah. <laughs> solve no, it. No, it's, it's too messy to solve in the mm. next 10 years. <laughs> yeah. And even if, you know, like you said, there's vested interest in, you know, that, that's probably not going to happen. But I think one of the other things I'm really excited about Endless um, is multicultural music. So, these collaborations, Web3 offers people, I mean, we're, we have people from all over the world here right now. And what happens when, you know, um, somebody from South Africa and somebody from Malaysia and somebody from America collaborate on a song together? Everyone's bringing their culture, their, their musical preference, their style to the table. And I think what you guys are doing, we're actually going to see, like, an emergence of like new genres and cultures, music cultures coming together. You know, I'm excited to see what is produced yeah. after being inspired from different parts of the world and you bring that inspiration all in one space. Yeah, and by, by dropping the barriers to collaboration, the barriers to who you can collaborate with, it makes it, it's, it's very frictionless. You can try. You can be experimental. Um, I was chatting. Well, it's a couple of years ago now, but I was chatting to um, uh, head of digital, I think, at, at Warner um, about what we were doing, and she was saying that um, you know one of the big problems, like the, the major labels have, um, well, all labels have, is like they see these huge markets, like the Latin market is huge, U.S. music market huge, all these different genre, like subgenres in the U.S., and then you've got K-pop, and then like all these different styles coming out of China, etc. Um, there's a huge opportunity to cross-pollinate audiences there. Um, the problem is that to get, you know, to get like BTS to do a collab with someone in the U.S. Um, involves a ton of negotiation and then you, and then scheduling just to just to even see if it might even work. If you have a platform where you could just you know in private go like, hey, should we let, let's just set up a jam? Um, and you could do, you know, just see how it goes. Um, the potential to get to really fruitful collaborations that will bring audiences audiences together, um, invent new cultural experiences that come when two cultures come together is huge, I think. And two, I feel like when creation happens, it's, it's almost like a spiritual experience. And so those moments, you know, you sit in a room with a co-write or you sit in a room while um, co-writers and a producer are putting together a song, it's, it's very magical. It's, it's something very special. To, you almost produce a song, baby, and you present it into the world, but it is, it is a very magical process. And what you guys are doing at Endless, like you said earlier, fuses together these relationships. The tech isn't just tech, it's actually building these relationships and these magic moments of collaboration. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the word magic, I mean, maybe it sounds a bit cliche, but we actually, we talk a lot about magic. Um, we, we want to optimize everything for, for magic, because it is, as you say, it's a magical experience, um, particularly for the people who are participating. But, um, you know, there is, we know from speaking to our, uh, the Endless community, that there is, there's an, uh, the aha moment experience in Endless is when you drop into a jam, you lay down a, a riff, you add a layer to something, and then it comes back 10, 20, 30 seconds later, and someone has added something in real time on top of what you've just done. That, that's the moment um, that people who've had that experience um, stick around forever. Yeah. Um, and I think that uh, one of the things we're really focusing on right now is how, how we can accelerate people into that experience. Um, and then also how, how we can sort of create 
um, a bit of a like front row audience around that. So you don't necessarily have to be um, part of, you know, if you have 10 people creating at once is probably a bit too much. Five, pe five people creating uh, at the same time is this kind of like perfect, um, a perfect mix. But then how can, we, how can we invite people in, say 50 people in, to have a kind of front row experience that really understand what's going on, that maybe kind of know these people a little bit from seeing what they've done in the endless ecosystem. Like that's how we propagate the magic. But you know, we're here to propagate magic. Yeah, <laughs> I love it, I love it. And the collaboration thing, you know, it, being in the music space, this is, this is in the music, current music industry, songwriting, um, co-writing together is quite, you know, the, it, it's quite the thing to do in the music space because you're co-writing with another artist, you're, you're practically almost buying into that song through your creative. And so bringing all that stuff together, like you guys are just doing a great job and being able to recognize, pull those things together, one space, meant in real time, create community and make it a gaming experience. But I know since we've got about five minutes left, we kind of want to walk through oh, the slide yeah. a little bit. Um, the numbers that they are putting up right now is very impressive um, in the music space. And there's so many people that actually have creativity and they hear music, but they've never touched an instrument. Or they, like, they want to get these things out, but endless, you've got access to so many different ways that you can be an artist without actually like having to go through learning the studio equipment or you know you could come in and write on something but those things are really interesting because I think we're actually even giving people a way to be an artist that maybe never put themselves in that category before. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I'm um, I'm thinking how best to kind of um I mean this is our deck. I won't maybe I could do the potted pitch, but I think you were um you wanted to talk about these, these numbers. Yeah, I, mean, I, this think is it's, I think seeing like some of the numbers you guys are doing right now, um, how many users are on the platform currently? Um, let's see. Here we are. Yeah. OK. So yeah, we've got, there's over 150,000 accounts on the platform. Um, this is already out of, a little bit out of date. I think we're over 160,000 now. Um, 28,000 jams created. So jams are kind of like their rooms where people can come together. So these are uh, individual contexts that people have been like, I started this jam, you and I could have a jam. That's our room to co-create in. Um, we're seeing actually the, uh, now we're seeing it's about seven or 8,000 original risks per day being created. So we're really beginning to get into the, to the growth phase. Um, which is super, is super exciting for us. Um, and riffs are like stems, right? Of riffs, a song? Are, riffs are kind of like, um, like our uh, music's answer to a TikTok video. It's like a short form piece of music. It's like 30 seconds to a minute of music. It loops around. It's got multiple layers in it. Um, you can experience it as like a short piece of music. It's just like awesome. um, you can kind of consume it in, in one go. Yeah. It's not an entire song. Um, but it's also got all the, all the layers that, that all the contributors added into that. So if you collect a riff as an NFT, um, one, of the, uh, one of the permissions you get by collecting that token, or one of the permissions you will get, but this is still in development, we haven't shipped this yet, but you can then create a remix of that NFT. You start a jam, which is a remix jam for that, that riff, um, and you can add layers on top of it, you can remix it, you can turn that into an NFT, and there'll be residual royalties going back to the original creator. So we're kind of creating this like cascading royalty uh, system. So that's what a riff is. It's like a short form TikTok style piece of music. Um, that is, it's like, it's kind of rich interactive media. So it's completely unbundable as well. Yeah. That's awesome. And so you guys have already pulled in 150,000 users, 160. And so there's so much collaboration already happening. We're, you know, you guys are still young and growing this quickly. And I think it also speaks to the collaborative nature of music in general. And so, I mean, you guys are growing at the speed of light and I, I'm really excited to see what music comes of this? What are these new genres? What are these, you know, being in the music industry, everything's always been housed in little bubbles. And as mm. we've seen more global collaboration, we're seeing genres bleed into each other. So yeah. I think that's what I'm most excited about is seeing what product comes from that and, and how these artists create additional revenue streams that 
ultimately fund more art. Yeah. Well, it's, it's bringing about a music. Uh, it, it, it redefines music as something that is relational mm -hmm. rather than just a product we consume. Um, so genre, you know, genres and um, territories and so on is very much uh, how we talk about like the old music industry. Um, I think in the, the future music industry, it's, it's all going to be, you know, there's going to be a lot to do with reputation. There's going to be a lot to do with history. There's a lot to do with like who you interacted with when. Um, and the music that arises out of it will be kind of mementos that will probably become embedded in culture, but in different ways, as mu in a much more almost kind of tribal way. I think, yeah, something like that. I'm here for that. I'm all about community. I'm all about creatives, as I know you are too. Um, I think that about wraps us up now. But Tim, wow, this has been fantastic. Very excited to see where you guys go in the future. And I definitely started my own endless account. Yeah, guys, I'm going to create some beats. So get ready for that. <laughs> <laughs> Can't wait. Thank you so much, Thank man. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank Amber. you guys for being here. Thank you. <laughs>
lots of features and no customers, or very few customers. Right? And it's almost kind of by nature of who we are, right? Because a technical founder is someone who can come out of the gates, have an idea, and start implementing quickly. And then you, you, you have a certain amount of stuff built, and then you think, hmm, how am I going to get the people in the door? Right? And so I'd like to actually uh, focus some time on this. Um, and also note, just I'm seeing some people taking pictures. You're welcome to take pictures of the slides. If you follow, um, follow our, our Twitter handle, Pagoda Platform, uh, we'll be tweeting out the slides. We'll also be tweeting out recordings of these talks and all of our talks, actually, over time. So uh, if you just follow that Twitter handle, you'll get all the slides there. So I'd like to break this into two parts, the mini features part uh, to start with. And so mini features, um, I, probably most people are familiar with the term MVP. At, at this point, I think that's kind of like, it's like ROI or uh, you know, other, some other three-letter acronym. It's sort of business jargon uh, that's pretty common at this point in time. Um, but in MVP, if you're not familiar with it, it's a minimum, minimum viable product. If you're not familiar with it and you're interested in being a technical founder, you should get yourself familiar with this. Worth a Google search or two. Um, or, or sometimes it's talked about as a minimum, minimum valuable product, which is another useful concept to be thinking about. And uh, I would say for those of us who are technical founders or think of technical founders, um, if you pretty much, uh, in my experience, if you ask someone, are you working on your MVP? Do you have your MVP, et cetera? The answer will be, yes, we're working on it. It's coming along. We're kind of not quite ready with it yet, et cetera. Uh, in my experience, you're already overbuilt. You're already a long ways past. And uh, I did this myself. Like, this is, I, you know, it's, it's not a big deal. There's, you know, there's a path to success, even though you may have overbuilt. Uh, and by way of analogy, I'm going to share something that I think of as the sneaky MVP. And this came to me by way of... Um, uh, actually, somebody else in the space. So when I built that first product, uh, it started having some traction, some success. And one of the big VC people in, the, in that space, and actually the CEO of the biggest company in the space, wanted to get dinner. He, wanted, he invited my, my uh, co-founder and myself to dinner and started asking us questions like our pricing strategy and personas and how do we get to an MVP and other things like that. And we kind of were like, well, we just kind of built it. And like, well, what was your pricing strategy? Well, we just kind of chose a number. Uh, and, you know, we didn't have really great answers. I don't think he was very impressed, uh, which is all right. But he, you know, the conversation continues, et cetera. And he was like, well, let me, let me tell you what I mean by, like, a better MVP. Uh, and he described this to me. And uh, it was create a landing page, put a logo on it, have the why, who it's for, what problem it solves, as concisely as you possibly can. And then put a button on the page and say, sign up now. And maybe be put even like, sign up now for $20 or something like that. And that's it. You have that page, you build it, and then they click the button. On the other side, it says, awesome, thank you. We're in our closed alpha right now. We don't have our beta, we'll, but we'll be in touch with you as soon as we're ready to release. And that's it. That's all you build. And that is the MVP. And at the time when I heard that, I was, I was uh, a little bit outraged. I was like, that's ridiculous. You're lying to people. You shouldn't, you shouldn't do that sort of thing. Um, and I don't think that is the path for technical founders, but I share that as an example of something that is, I think, uh, a challenge. Like, as we, the, the challenge to getting an MVP is creating something that you can get in front of customers as quickly as possible, or potential customers as quickly as possible, and getting their feedback. Is this actually going to be something you use? And again, as technical founders, we're often, um, you know, we can produce things quickly and well, uh, but getting them in front of people is where we really struggle, and that's what I'll talk about next. There's another um, thing I'll just mention, there's the idea of a, a uh, lean startup. So there's a book that was written a while ago. There's actually two books here that I recommend along these lines um, for those of you who are into books. There's also, an actually, I actually pulled these numbers last night, a, a uh, lean startup meetup, uh, which has something like, uh, 4 million members and about 4,000 active chapters worldwide. You know, there's no guarantee that there's an active chapter anywhere near where you live. But if you, again, are a, a technical founder and kind of thinking about how do you get out there and how you actually turn this into a sustaining business, there are other like-minded folks out in the world, and Lean Startup might be a tool that could help you as you go on this journey. The other part of that, lots of features, few customers, frankly, is marketing. Uh, and marketing is something, again, that many technical co-founders, including myself, do not understand well. This is just super, super common. Uh, it's like this weird voodoo stuff. It's something we're vaguely suspicious about, uh, at least in my own case, I certainly was. Uh, I've come a long way since then. Uh, I've realized it's absolutely 
100% necessary for you to actually get in front of customers is to be better at communicating with folks. And so uh, it's just communication, though, air quotes, right? So communication is something that's actually quite difficult to do well. And I think about it in my own personal life, like in my professional life, the number of times I miscommunicate about something that I think I'm communicating pretty clearly about is like it happens a lot. Right? I think I'm just saying things really clearly to people who would have lots of reason to trust me and believe me and think I've you know, well intended, etc. And that's with people who know me and, and love me and whatnot. Um, communicating with strangers, even harder to do well. So communication, while it's simple, it is definitely not easy. Uh, and two tools that I would recommend for any technical founder who wants to get better at communicating, which you must do in order to find customers, uh, are a messaging framework. And then this other tool as well. But a messaging framework, if you Google up a messaging framework, uh, I'm actually curious. Has anyone here ever done, used, built, created a messaging framework? Got a couple, oh yeah, all right. I see a couple, fra uh, couple, couple, couple hands in the back there. Um, messaging frameworks are one of my favorite tools to help craft your message. They're very simple. If you Google it, they all look a little bit like what I'm, the screenshot I'm showing here. They have like three columns, uh, some rows across the top, talk about what's your value proposition, what is it you're trying to communicate, how do you support that, like what things, so you say you're fast, you say you're scalable, you say you're easy to use, like prove it. Like what are the things that actually help you demonstrate this? So it's really super, and there's again a ton of, um, you know, again, Google it, read three blog posts, you'll be like 80% an expert. It's great. Another exercise, another tool that I found super helpful, especially at the second product company I was a part of, was an exercise we called 10, 30, or 130 10. And I don't know actually where to attribute this to. I'm sure we did uh, invent it, but it was a really w powerful way to like start by describing the thing you're doing in 100 words approximately, right? So what's the thing you're doing? What's your product? What's your platform? What's your tool? Do it, describe it. Uh, what's your launch? Whatever the thing is, 100 words. Okay, type for a while, type for a while, think, good, all right. Work with a colleague back and forth, awesome. Get to 100 pretty good words. And then you challenge yourself, okay, all right. Now, we trim it to 30. Ooh, okay, all right, 30 words. Got to trim out a lot of stuff. You lose some of the granularity, you lose some of the detail. You have to start summarizing, you have to start, you know, getting, all right, what's the important thing here? Can't have all of this stuff. Get, you know, get rid of a bunch. And then that's a pretty hard process. But then the next is, anybody want to guess how many words? Woo, all right, there we go. We got a winner, 10, exactly. You get to 10 words, more or less. You know, we used to allow 12. If you could do eight, you're amazing. But, you know, ish, right? Trying to reduce it again, just dramatically down to what's the kernel of the thing you're trying to communicate. Because it turns out the world is a pretty busy place. Everybody has got, you know, uh, we actively filter as human beings. It's something that we need to do to like, make sense of the world. And so if you take too long to explain what it is you're trying to do or why it might be useful or valuable, it, you're simply just going to lose the chance to engage with that person over time. Um, and as I was walking around the stage, actually, in, in the, uh, this, this space here, uh, I saw this on the floor, the build something users want. And so I think a lot of, you know, like this is kind of the crux of the problem. And it's not to say if you have a lot of features and few customers that you haven't built something that people want. But it might be the case that you've built something only part of what they want. Or you need to just change a little bit. Or maybe you can't, you're not explaining it well. They don't understand what the things are that you're building and why they might be valuable. And so uh, figuring out a way to communicate the features you do have and then listen to the, what people are telling you back is an incredibly important part of get, making it through the gauntlet and uh, finding yourself success as a technical founder. That leads to change. No matter how good your idea is, how good your execution is, you're going to have change that you deal with. Uh, and so one of the things that's a real challenge to technical founders often, and anyone who's starting a company, is n like staying true to your course through change, through constant change. So I recommend that if you are starting off on a journey of figuring out what you want to do and, and starting an, uh, an organization, acknowledge that there will be change from what you think today, but take some time to write down some really important things. What are your personal motivations? Why are you personally excited about this thing? What are the goals? What, what, what's it going to contribute to in order to do what? Right? Are you trying to make the world a better place? Are you trying to get rich? Are you, you know, some range of many different things. Like very, very articulate about what it is you are trying to do. Um, and then, what success look like, right? And uh, if you have those written down, 
you will be surprised by how often that helps you as you get to the point of a big decision. I think another common thing for technical founders is to wonder, is it time to pivot? Have I already invested too much? What's the future? And is this really any good at all? These questions are super, super common. And when you're asking those questions of yourself or of your teammates, being able to review the things you thought were important when you started is a really helpful grounding point of uh, uh, perspective. So with that, I'll close out just a, a few pieces of advice to technical founders. Um, so uh, self-doubt is normal. I, there were a few uh, technical founders who raised their hands, shyly said, yeah, I'm a technical founder. Um, if anybody's willing, like, uh, uh, do any of you as technical founders wonder if you're still good at anything? If you want a fleeting hand, let's see a couple of fleeting hand. Oh, yep, there are, there's a bold hand. Yes, yeah, yeah. Okay, that's normal, right? Because you, you've done the part that you know how to do well, and now you have to learn all of this other stuff, and it's really hard. Communicating, building marketing plans, building business plans, etc. It is super, super normal for technical founders to get... To you know, over the euphoria of having built something and then, uh, I'm not sure I'm any good at all. You are. You, by, by virtue of like having pushed through it, you are. Let me just, you know, please. Um, if you continue to follow your passion, it will fuel you and your team. It's a very powerful thing. So continue to talk about that. If you're by yourself, remember it. Remember why you're doing this. And if you're working with teammates as well, communicating clearly with the people who are working with you about what your passion is and why that's important is a really powerful success predictor. And the last thing I'll say is uh, bias towards action. Plans will never, ever be perfect. You, you, they are helpful. They, you know, have a business plan, have other things like that. Uh, but if, you, if you're not sure, don't go... Another meeting might not be the answer, right? It might be do something. So bias toward action whenever you can. And that's it. That's what I wanted to share. It was 15 minutes. It's not a lot of time to help people, but I'm curious. So my goal was to hopefully help some technical founders or teammates of technical founders. Did I? Anybody got a hand? Who, who, do we got some? Oh, 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 that's like a lot of hands. All right. I'm very pleased. Thank you very much. Um, that's it. And I know I'm out of time, but I'm happy to talk about any of this stuff later at, back at the booth, etc. And that concludes the day in, at the Nightshade Room. And please enjoy the happy hour outside. See you tomorrow. <laughs>